Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today we're going to be confronting a recent broadcast. Matter of fact, I think it was just two days ago that this broadcast was put out in which my name was brought up a couple times uh, by Jeff Durbin there at uh, Apologia Studios. Um, I've gone back and forth with Jeff a few times over the years. Uh, generally, fairly cordial guy. I wish he would have a discussion with me um, as I invited him to do many, many years ago. And the invitation still is open for us to have that discussion. Um, because I, I think that it would bring some clarity to the body um, and for people to understand why we disagree with Calvinists uh, like Jeff Durbin uh, while still supporting much of what they do in ministry. I, I like Jeff. I, I generally agree with a lot of what Jeff says and does, especially uh, in his in his ministry and his work uh, there at Apologia. But um, he and I obviously differ with each other when it comes to our understanding of soteriology. And so that's what I'm confronting today. As I've said before, many times on many broadcasts, you can love someone, you can have a, a genuine respect and uh, appreciation for their ministries and their work, while at the same time disagreeing with their uh, particular take on soteriology. And that's the way I feel about Jeff. And I assume uh, if you were to corner him and ask him, he would probably feel very much the same about me, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but before we jump into this, I do want to remind you to download the app if you haven't done so. Uh, the Sotriology 101 app will allow you to have access to all this content. Uh, if you are looking for a higher theological education, also consider a Trinity Seminary, where I teach as a theology professor. And uh, and I know that there are many others uh, who are um, teachers at Trinity who may not disagree, may not agree with me on every point, which is why uh, I think Trinity is a great school because it, have, it has various viewpoints. In fact, we've had Chris Date on the program, who's another professor there who holds to more of a Calvinistic perspective. Uh, we've also had Tim Stratton, who is a Molinist, who was on just uh, a couple of days ago. If you haven't heard that broadcast, you should. Um, and we, of course, um, been with the Trinity radio guys, uh, Braxton and Jonathan, uh, Braxton Hunter and Jonathan Pritchett, who are part of Trinity as well. And uh, we appreciate them so much. Also, for those who give on a regular basis, I just wanted to say thank you for our regular patrons. If you would like to support us, we would greatly appreciate it. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we appreciate those who give on a regular basis. Now, what uh, Apologia Studios has been doing the last several weeks is kind of walking through Tulip, uh, and they are on the U, uh, Unconditional Election, and they're defending that. And as I mentioned, they bring me up in a, in a, cup, a couple of times in this uh, discussion. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to, in contrast to good Calvinistic brothers who are trying to, I think, with good intentions, expound upon what they believe the Bible is teaching, I want you to hear how I would respond and react to their views live in person here. I can see the side chats. Uh, I see uh, Mike Lyons there. I see Amber Sumner, uh, uh, CJ uh, Sumner. Thank you all guys for uh, for tuning in. Um, I, I see your, your, your side chat. And comments. And as I am able to distract myself and look over those comments, if I see a question that, uh, that I guess uh, pertains to what we're talking about, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, then, you know, uh, I may in interject it. And so, uh, just, just so you know, I'm, I'm trying to hear, uh, hear what they're saying on the line here uh, through the video, as well as your side chat comments. And sometimes it's it's difficult to to see everything at, at one time. Uh, there's Warren in the side chat, and he says he has Durbin has the best beard in theology, <laughs> and I'm sure Durbin would be would appreciate you saying that. Uh, Doctor Al Garza is in the side chat. Hey, uh, Brother Al, uh, Doctor Al uh, Garza, appreciate you jumping on. Um, and, and there are many others over in the side set. Hello from Louisiana. Uh, looking forward to this as well. So, uh, and, and Kyle says he's here to hear, uh, for, for Durbin's rebuttals. Um, I, I wish Durbin would just come on the, the broadcast. Uh, I, I don't know why he has rejected those invitations over the years, but I would gl be glad to have him. I would give him equal time. I, I'm not a, as many of you know, I've interviewed a lot of Calvinists on our program. I'm always, I, I, I think I'm always pretty cordial and uh, gi giving them time and, and plenty of space to, to, to lay out their views. I, I'm not trying to misrepresent Calvinists. That's why I let Calvinists represent themselves. I don't know how better to let somebody represent themselves. I, I don't know how better to represent a view than allow the, the best scholars and the adherence to it to speak for themselves. And that's what I try to do on this broadcast uh, quite quite regularly. And uh, some people are here for the, the, the country draw because us Texans here, you know how we are. So God bless you. Bless your heart. 
I'll, I'll try to turn it on just for you, Jamie. <laughs> you can enjoy my Texas drawl. All right. So let's jump in here. Um, we're picking up around the 24 minute mark where they begin to get into the content of the broadcast. And uh, as we always do, we'll just kind of stop and go uh, through this. Um, I've got it sped up just a little bit so we can get through a little bit more content. And so hopefully you can hear it. Let me know volume wise if it's okay. If it needs to be turned down, I can turn it down. If you need to be turned up, I don't think I can do anything about it. But I can uh, I can turn it down if I need to. So let me know sound wise how it is. Wait, here we go. Why don't we talk about the gospel? Why don't we talk about the glory of God? Why don't we talk about the grace of God and salvation? Now, it's really important. I know we have a lot of listeners uh, and supporters that are that are supporters of this ministry that you're not uh, uh, professing to be reformed or uh, Calvinistic in your soteriology. You don't necessarily hold to all the points of of, of Calvinism, the five points and, and tulip and and um, and uh, we love you and, and the Lord loves you and we can serve the Lord. Too. I don't know that I could say the same. I, I don't know that there's anyone who supports Soteriology 101 who is a Calvinist. At least there's none of them that have, have uh, indicated so. Um, and, and, you know, obviously this ministry is very focused upon the doctrines of Calvinism and my journey in and out of Calvinism. And so that's understandable, whereas obviously Apologia Studios does a a broad range of different ministries and context. And I, and I've said before, the reason I do that is to keep this ministry separate from what I do in my evangelism ministry, because I don't want it to be overrun by that, uh, to keep my evangelism and apologetic ministry separate over in the Texas Baptist world uh, from the sociology 101 world, I think was important for me to be able to stay focused in my work as an evangelist and as an apologist, because I don't want that in-house debate clouding what I do in evangelism and apologetics. And so that's one of the reasons I've, I've created this, this site. Or together, uh, holding around the essential gospel. But what is important to us in terms of like, well, why are you reformed? And why do you hold to uh, the doctrines of grace? I would say, well, I'm, I'm reformed primarily because of a fundamental principle in re reformational theology. And that is that the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith. Uh, uh, and so with that, if we go to the Bible and say... Well, that, that's not the decisive reason that you're a reformed theologian, i.e. a Calvinist, because we all believe what you just stated. In other words, you didn't state a decisive reason as to why you're a Calvinistic interpreter of Scripture, because we all believe in the authority of Scripture. And so stating the, that you believe the authority of Scripture is the reason you're a Calvinist is a little bit of question begging. It assumes that the, the Scripture teaches Calvinism. The real reason you're a Calvinist is because God elected you to be. He, he decreed in eternity past for Jeff Durbin to become a Calvinist interpreter of the Scripture. Uh, and you should say that. And the reason you should say that is so that people who don't become Calvinist can recognize that the reason they're not Calvinist is because God hasn't elected them or decreed them to be Calvinist for whatever reason. And I think the reason that Calvinists don't spell that out real clearly is because that reveals how really irrational their views are. And in, in, in if nothing else, it at least implies in part that God is the reason that many Christians don't become Calvinistic Christians or don't interpret the text the way they do. And the reason I oftentimes think that Calvinists won't pull that out and won't state that or they mock people who do is because it really reveals one of the fault lines of their entire worldview, which is the free thinking argument we talked about with Tim Stratton in a uh, the last program that I had, because he he argues using a, a logical syllogism that God does not, uh, you know, God would not be a deity of deception is his is argument. In other words, if you have a, a, a deception or a deceptive view or a false view of any view of theology, if you're wrong about any one point of theology on Calvinism, it's because God decreed you to be wrong about that point in theology. And that would make God a uh, author of deception, a deity of deception, one who d decreed to, for his own child to be deceived, which is not tenable. It's not workable. It's not practical. And it also impugns the character of God. So we shouldn't believe that. And so this is another one of the, again, you know, people think it, I'm just joking. Oh, he's just joking. God decreed him to be a, you know, anti-Calvinist. No, I, I'm not. That's not a joke. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, a rational, a uh, logical argument that has been formalized by theologians and philosophers showing why determinism and the theological system of Calvinism as a whole does not have a rational basis on which to uh, to ultimately make its arguments. And so that's, what, that's why we point that out. Say, what does the Bible say about the grace of God and salvation? What does the Bible say about the sovereignty of God? Um, I believe that drives you uh, to uh, a, a necessary conclusion in terms of a systematic way of looking at this, and that is the doctrines of grace um, in salvation. And so why do this? Why talk about this if it's an area of controversy? My position on it is, I believe this is important because the Bible talks so much about this. 
That's why I think it's important. If God spends entire discourses explaining his grace and salvation and his sovereignty and predestination and election and the gifts of repentance and gifts of faith, if God spends so much time talking about it, I believe in the perspicuity of scripture. I believe in the clarity of scripture. The scripture is clear. And I believe that if God speaks about it, so should we. And it doesn't mean that all of us are perfectly together in all of our theological commitments and that all of us don't have gaps or maybe some inconsistencies here or there. Um, it's, 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 Addressing this issue is an issue. Again, that's why I was pointing out earlier. Why do we have inconsistencies? Why, why do we have various views? Why do you disagree with any one of your other Calvinistic brothers on various views of uh, you know all the different points you argue with your Calvinistic friends over? Well, because God decreed unchangeably for some of your Christian Calvinistic friends even to disagree, to have a deceptive view, to have a, a wrong view about God or about theology or about the Bible. And why would God do that? Um, and, and would God do that? Is God the kind of God who would decree his own child to misunderstand or misinterpret the text? And that's why I think we have to have a, a basis of libertarian freedom, if nothing else, even for the believer, because uh, otherwise you would have God decreeing for or choosing for people to be deceived uh, through his scripture. Um, and and I would agree with a lot of what he's saying here with regard to why we talk about this. Uh, matter of fact, that's a good defense as to why we have Sociology 101. Why do we talk about this? Because it is vital. It is important. What, what more important things are there than the, the doctrines of God's grace and his goodness and his love and his provisions and uh, and election and predestination and sovereignty? What, what, what more important matters are there to discuss? Now, granted, I, I know the Dallas Cowboys are playing to the Washington uh, what are they called now? I used to call them Washington Redskins for the Washington Generals. Like, isn't that Generals? Is that what they're called, Generals? The, Washington. Uh, they're playing Washington today at three, a, a couple of hours from now. I like the playing. I like watching. But let, let's just think about that. Think about how many millions of dollars and how much time is spent on people talking about carrying a pigskin across the line or putting a little round ball into a hole or whatever other sports ball thing that's out there as Braxton Hunter calls it, sports ball. I love the way he says that. Um, I'm putting things in perspective, folks. Do you go onto the Dallas Cowboy fan page and say, why do you keep talking about football? Rah! Of course you don't. Because you realize that they created that page for football and for Cowboys. Stop talking about the Cowboys. Is that all you ever think about is Dallas Cowboys? How dare you? No, these people who have the Dallas Cowboy page probably have a life outside of the Dallas Cowboys. They probably have families and friends, and they probably golf and fish. Some of them might even be really strong Christian leaders in their community and witnessing to others who are on the Dallas Cowboy fan page. Why? Because the Dallas Cowboy fan page was created for fanning out about the Dallas Cowboys and talking about football. That's what it's for. Well, we have a page dedicated to talk about the doctrines of God's grace and goodness and predestination and election and sovereignty. And I get so many people, people, some of whom even agree with me, how oh, just stop talking about their stuff. Oh my gosh. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I'm, I'm being mean, but not really. No, you, you deserve this because sometimes I'll open up your page and you'll have post after post after post about sports ball where you will debate every single nuance of every single play of every single thing that every single commentator said about what another commentator said about what another commentator said about football. And we were talking about the grace of God here, the purpose for which we exist on this earth, people. Sorry. It's on my soapbox because too many times I get people posting on my page. Oh, I'll stop talking about this stuff. Oh, you go do something else. Oh, you know, get, get out there and evangelize. After I just came back from preaching on evangelism and training uh, over 250 people this morning in evangelism today, and then oh, I stop talking about this stuff. Blah, 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 blah. You'd rather me have a broadcast on sports ball. Okay. Sorry. That wasn't even about Jeff. Jeff probably would agree with me about that. I'm, I'm agreeing with Jeff on this. This is an important matter. We should we should have broadcast and we should talk more about this than we do sports ball. So, all right. An issue talk. of defending the grace and glory of God in salvation. That's mm -hmm. where our heart is in this discussion. It's not just this theological discussion up here. Mm -hmm. It's not to create division. It's not to uh, to be haughty or prideful in theology. It's not to be part of a club. So, but I can't say this, by the way, you remember when we first started Apologia Radio, like there was this huge movement towards like Calvinism. The young, restless, the young reformed. restless reformed. The young restless reformed. Proud, proud card carrying member. That's right. Yeah, this, this <laughs> Which kind of is a contradiction. Huge, <laughs> huge movement towards uh, Calvinism and reformed theology. And that the challenge I think with it was is that at the time Calvinism was 
cool, right? It was cool. You had guys with with beards and you had guys with cigars and it's kind of like a, you know, that's a cool little that's a cool little click to be a part of. And mm-hmm. and I, I I was fearful then and we talked about it early on. There are so many people that were becoming Calvinists or reformed yeah. who didn't really even understand why they were. Like right. when mm-hmm. I when I was officially becoming reformed and Calvinistic, I had spent just so much time just digging into the scriptures and fighting them. Like, what does the text say? Was it challenging my traditions? And at the time, it wasn't cool to be Calvinist, especially in the circles that I was in. I was like around Calvary Chapel guys and all that stuff. So it wasn't cool for me to like become reformed and to, to, to believe the doctrines of grace. I was fearful early on as we started Apologia Radio, as you saw this movement of people becoming reformed and Calvinistic, that they don't even know why they're doing it. They don't even know why they're believing it. It's, it's like they're just joining a click. They're, they're clicking up. They're, this is my crew. I like this. It's a cool little culture. And um, I was fearful then yeah. that, you know, you don't know why you're really doing this. And it's no, right. the commitments aren't really there. Um, and there's a draw to some of the aspects of it that was like, this is almost like a faux masculinity too. There's beards, there's pipes, there's yeah. men wearing flannel, you know, they're smoking cigars, all these, all these things. And so there was the allure That's of that aspect too, of the young men were, were hungry for yeah. community rich masculinity. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I want to be a part of that. And and, and, and and a concern for the scriptures and theology. Yeah. That's yeah. a big it's a big point yeah. too. The aesthetic wasn't the main thing, but yeah. that was definitely a Yeah, big, a big point of it. Okay, I, I think they're they're bringing out a valid point that Calvinism in a sense the the new restless reformed type of Calvinism was kind of um uh, just a fad and still is to a lot of Calvinists in my opinion. Um I was a part of the early turn toward that direction. Uh, I graduated um, from high school about 93, I guess it was. And right about that time is when I was introduced to John MacArthur through a, a Calvinistic mentor and became a Calvinist around 93, 94, and was a Calvinist all through my 20s. I wrestled with it too. It wasn't that cool to be a Calvinist by any means. My parents certainly weren't Calvinist and were fighting against uh, the concept of me uh, adopting it. My home church was going through a split over the issue. So it was something that was dividing my family. And so it was not a cool thing. But I, I, like Jeff, really wrestled with this. And I was convinced at that time that Calvinism was true. And so I defended it because I thought it was true. Um, Now, I didn't go the way of the flannel and beards, even though I got a beard now. Um, and the tattoos and cigars and whiskey and all that kind of stuff that kind of became of this, what he was referring to as a kind of this faux masculinity. Um, but a lot of people in that, that movement kind of at least were marked by that direction as well. But that's not universal. Obviously I I knew a lot of clean cut, you know, clean shaven, uh, anti teetotal, you know, anti beard teetotaling types of Calvinist in my circles too. And you still do know a few that are that way that are that are very much conservative in all of those areas as well as in uh, their sociology as being Calvinistic, and so that that's that there crosses some lines there. But it generally is he's correct in acknowledging this fad ish kind of a movement of Calvinist, and I think he's expressing good reasons to be concerned about people adopting a worldview because of a fad, but. Again, it comes back to this issue, Jeff and and Apologia Studio guys. Why would God ordain that? Have you have you considered that? Have you considered why would God sovereignly and unchangeably decree for these flannel wearing, you know, long bearded, tattooed up whiskey drinkers to to come into this way of thinking in a fad like way, in such a way that it's going to die back out, which is what is being predicted, and and cause you to fear what. Why, what, what do you have to fear about that? God, you believe God sovereignly and unchangeably ordained this fad, and yet you're expressing concern and being upset about it. That that doesn't that doesn't that just doesn't make sense to me. And that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to get Calvinists to explain is why do you express frustration or fear or doubt about that which you also believe God unchangeably brought to pass for His own glorification that doesn't make sense to me and that's that's what i'm pointing pointing out what seems to be inconsistency in some of the the calvinistic uh uh, discourse the the culture was a big point sorry (laughs) excuse me so um not covid don't worry um no (laughs) noise of the warm people don't worry don't make that noise in here (laughs) um and so but okay but i think when you see have seen so many people who you know, truly became reformed and understood why this is important and they still are today. That's that's great. But you see so many people that eventually just sort of fell off and said, no, I don't really buy that anymore. I don't believe it anymore. And or they just started off very intensely wielding it as a battle axe to chop other Christians Yeah, to down. hurt other people as the cage stage, yeah, right? Exactly. But you see so many people... And again, why would God ordain that? I mean, you have to believe God ordained whatsoever comes to pass. God decreed whatsoever comes to pass on your system. 
So God decreed cage-stage Calvinism and those people wielding Calvinism to tear up everybody else around them and causing church splits and all the problems that you don't like about this Young Restless Reform movement. God ordained it sovereignly. So God ordained for his own truth, as you believe it is, to cause all of this havoc within his body. Why? And why And why are you speaking out against it? Who are you to talk back to God, oh man? Why in the world would you talk back to his divine and sovereign decree to bring about this cage-stage Calvinism conflict within the church? That, that again, I do not see a rational answer to that question. People that have said, well, I was, I was a Calvinist, you know, 10 years ago. Now I'm not. And you see them even arguing mm -hmm. against it today. You're like, you're arguing against a straw man. Like reform folks don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And like, how did you not know? Okay. This is the, you don't understand Calvinism defense. Okay. Anyone who's left Calvinism really wasn't a Calvinist. And this is what I, this is the same thing as what we we're talking about with the flattening out accusation of James White. What's he mean by that? Determinism is as flat of a system as one could possibly imagine. So when you state determinism very plainly, what you're doing is you're flattening it out. And if you're doing it in, in uh, admiration towards the, 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 the system, in other words, if you're affirming determinism and stating things plainly, hurrah, good for you, we love you. If you state determinism plainly and you disaffirm it, you don't agree with it, then, oh, you're misrepresenting it. You're flattening it out. This is, this is the way that Calvinists, this is the only way Calvinists know how to deal with those kinds of issues as to why God would ordain, decree, caged agers. You, you, can't, you can't answer it except for going, oh, you just don't understand. You just don't see the emperor's clothes. If you were more pious, more righteous, you would see the emperor's clothes. You would see what we mean by Calvinism. But because you're not one of us, you can't see Calvinism because you don't have the pious, righteous eyes to see it like we do. And all that's doing is they're avoiding answering the inherent difficulty of determinism and the problem of determinism on their system. And it's the only way they can do it is by deflecting through a red herring. Oh, you don't understand Calvinism. You don't know how to, to, uh, to, to uh, respond to us appropriately because you're not accepting our paradoxical contradictory uh, quandaries and concepts. And so that, that's, I think, really why we have to, to, to know these things down. Chris Harris uh, is one of our resident Calvinists. Thank you for your super chats, Chris. Um, God decree has no force on creation as the decree doesn't force anything on anyone. It's clear in the confessions. Okay. If, if Bing Yang calls it a causal decree, okay. He is one of the leading scholars that's being promoted right now. He calls it a causal decree. In other words, the decree is what ultimately is the cause of all that comes to pass. Now you can take that up with him, Chris, or you can cite for me, a leading scholar, leading scholars that teach and say that there is no causal link between the decree and what comes to pass. But even Piper and others say God brings all things to pass. If not, if if that's not, if by decree he's he's saying God brings about or brings to pass these evils, and he lists the atrocities like the Holocaust and even the molestation of a child. He lists those things in his discourse on that that he's quoting from from Mark Talbert. And so he's saying it brings it to pass. And yet you're saying there is no causal link between that which God decrees and that which comes about in time. And so I don't think that's Calvinism, Chris, as I've, I've, I've confronted you about this one before. You, you have adopted some kind of a watered down, um, non-causal form of de determinism, which is basically just another view of Arminianism that God sees what's happening and doesn't step in to, uh, to stop it. Therefore, he's quote unquote, allowing it to come to pass, which is just a permissive decree of God. And if that's what you mean, then you're an Armenian, not a Calvinist, I at least on that point, you're not. And so I, I just think that that's really important for you to understand that you're not arguing for theistic determinism. You, um, you're arguing some other system that you've maybe created up in your own mind, or you're misunderstanding th those systematics. And so if you want to, you know, present, you know, actual scholars that are notable scholars in the field that say, that there is no causal link between what God decrees and what actually happens in the world, then be my guess. But until then, I'm going to continue to confront what the, the leading scholars define as uh, theistic determinism and Calvinism. All right, moving on. I don't know the answer to that. That's been written about and spoken about so many times. How'd you miss it? You know, it's like, well, it's that they didn't really have the grounding of the scriptures underneath them in the first place to say, this is why I believe what I believe. So all that to say, we are doing this series, and I'm not sure how long it'll take us, but uh, we're doing this series. As long as it needs. Because we want to defend the grace of God in salvation. Now, this is vitally important to get. Everyone needs to understand this. 
if you are a professing Christian, you can't get away from the word grace. Sure. You can't get away from Election. believing it. No. You can't get away from um, uh, preaching it. You can't get away from teaching it. You can't get away from professing a, a trust in the grace of God. And it's important because what Reformed theology, and specifically the doctrines of grace, really do is they explain the grace of God and salvation and just how much of a gift that it actually is. Saying things like, the grace is not merely necessary, but it is sufficient, that it is powerful. God's grace is a powerful grace. It is a Don't call it sufficient. Um, we believe grace is sufficient too. You need to call it effectual. The difference between a sufficient grace and an effectual grace. A sufficient grace means it's enough. It's all that's needed. A, an effectual grace means that it's all that's needed and it's effectuated. It's caused. It, in other words, it um, it is it's the gift that's given effectually. In other words, like if I gave a, I've talked about this before. If I gave a computer to all four of my children, and then I have somehow effectuated them to use the computer the way I saw fit, then that would be the kind of gift he thinks that God gives. Is that he gives the gifts and then he effectuates how the person uses that gift in their lifetime. Okay. And then that would be an effectual gift. Now it's sufficient just to give the computer and let them do what they want to with it. And, and I could give them the freedom to use their, the, the computer as a, a doorstop if, if that's what they chose to use it as. But that's not, that doesn't reflect on me, the giver in any way, shape or form. It doesn't change the character of the giver if they misuse my gifts. And so that's on them. It's their, their responsibility as to how they use the gifts God has given them. So if they're given the gift to sing beautifully and they use it to sing Satanistic, you know, rants, then that's their responsibility. That's their fault. God still gave them the gift to sing beautifully. It's still a gift from God, but they're choosing how to use that gift. And thus they're held responsible. So as we've pointed out before, and we're going to get into this because this comes to the, the, the title of this that I put on the thumbnail, how gracious is God's grace is what he's going to get into. What's he mean by that? How effectual is God's grace is really what he should say. How irresistible is God's grace? Because grace for... Uh, for Jeff, gave, grace means gift. I mean, they're the same root word from charis, charisma. Um, grace is a gift, okay? So what he's ultimately saying is for a gift to really be great, for the greatest view of a gift is if it's effectually given. If it's not effectually given, then it's not as great of a gift on his view. In other words, what makes the greatness of a gift is, is, uh, is not the heart and the attitude and the character of the one giving it, but it's the, the effectuality of the gift being given on his view. And you, you can't assume that that's what makes a, great, a gift great. You have to establish that from the Bible. Because I would argue, obviously, that the grace that God provides for the entire world is greater than grace being effectually caused upon a select few. And so, and I can illustrate this a dozen, you know, if a multi-billionaire decided um, to grace gift everybody in the world um, a computer, okay, to use that analogy, um, is that greater than him giving it to 10% of the world and effectually causing the, that 10% to use it appropriately? Which one of those two is greater? Now, you can, you can try to argue, oh, well, giving it to 10% of the world and effectually causing them, somehow irresistibly causing them to use the computers the way he intends them to use it, that's a higher view of grace and gift than if he were to freely provide it for every single one in the world and allow them to use it freely. And, and some of them may misuse it. Some of them may throw it in the garbage. Some of them may use it for the right purposes and others may not, but that's on them. What, what I would argue is that I think that the one who provides it for the whole and gives it to the whole demonstrates a, a lack of partiality on his part, a lack of favoritism on his part, um, it shows that he's willing uh, to, not to be partial to any group of people or one section of people, but that he wants everyone and he genuinely desires everyone to take and use his gift appropriately. But he realizes that they need to have the freedom to do that themselves because he doesn't want to micromanage how the people use the gifts he gives. Because as a, a gracious giver, he wants to be able to, to give it freely and say, there's no strings attached. I want you to have this and use it appropriately. But if you choose not to, that's a reflection of their character as the recipient, not the character of the giver. The, the character of the giver is not affected any, in any way, shape, or form based upon how the recipients use his gifts. And, and, and Calvinists seem to just impose this concept. It's not true in any other walk of life where the giver is somehow a lesser person or a lesser, a lesser uh, gracious, less, 
less glorious and less gracious if he doesn't effectuate how the gift is used. Um, and, and that's why we're pushing back on this because actually, my, my, in my view, from my perspective and my understanding of what Scripture teaches, Jeff Durbin's view is lessening the grace of God because it's saying grace is only provided for a select few. And, and, and he's saying, no, it's, it's greater because he's providing it for a select few and he's effectually causing them to use it appropriately, except when they don't. Because that gets to the problem we talked about before on the deity of deception argument that we talked with Tim, Tim Stratton about. Because when Jeff Durbin sins, or when I sin, or when the other Christian sins, or go a wrong way, or do the wrong thing, what, what, is, what is the necessity of that argument? Well, God's grace wasn't as factual as it could be in that given circumstance, and or God decreed for his own child to sin in this circumstance versus having a way to resist temptation, as 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, that no temptation will overcome you. That is that is too difficult for you to bear. But on Calvinism, if God's decreed for you to sin at a given point in time, there is nothing that could keep you from sinning. He hasn't provided a way out for you because he has causally decreed for you to do that thing. And you can't do otherwise because Calvinists don't believe that he's permissively just allowing you to do anything freely. The reason you're doing it is because he has decreed for you to do it on Calvinism. And therefore, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 can't be true if Calvinism is true because he has not provided a way out to resist temptation if you fall into sin. It is a grace that works for God's purposes. When God gives the gift of grace, it is a powerful grace. It is a sufficient grace. Now, I want to say this. Roman Catholicism, it's, it's interesting. You talk to like, you know, uh, some Christians who are maybe just ignorant, and I don't mean in a bad way, but just, you know, ignorant. They just don't know of the real issues of divide between Rome and uh, Christianity or the gospel itself. The, when they get in a conversation with a Roman Catholic, uh, the, the Catholic will say, no, grace, we believe absolutely the salvation is of grace. It's all of God's grace. It's grace. God has to give grace. He has to give this grace. Um, and and it's, the Christian goes, oh, I'm kind of dumbfounded now. I thought that you guys were like just a workspace salvation thing. It's like, no, we believe grace is absolutely necessary. We're only saved by the grace of God. But as you dig into the system, you realize that it's not a grace that's that's sufficient. It's a grace that sort of is 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 moving. No, that's the wrong word, Jeff. It is a grace that's sufficient. Okay, it's sufficient. It's not effectual. He uses the word sufficient as if it means effectual, and that it, it's a grace that's enough. Okay, but it's not a grace that effectuates the right response as it is on your system. So you're using the word sufficient, but that's not the right word. Just to be clear. Moving to start, mm. but then there has to be the synergistic it's cooperation. A it's a partnering in grace, exactly. That's a good way to put that. There's the synergism that has to happen between the the, the rebel sinner and God. God moves with some grace. You got to cooperate a bit with that grace and keep cooperating in Rome with that grace through the sacraments and all the different things. And you know, make sure that you have enough righteousness in yourself. So you know, it's going to determine a lot of things. You know, pur purgatory, how much time in purgatory, all that stuff. Um, but mm. acknowledge this: that Mormonism. Yep, I was going to go there next. Talks about grace. The Watchtower talks about grace. Roman Catholicism talks about grace. Arminians talk about grace. Um, Leighton Flowers talks about grace. But the question is, is how gracious is God's grace according to the scriptures? And that's the issue. So that's the question. How gracious is God's grace according to the scripture? Meaning, basically what he's saying is how effectual is the gifts that God gives? Is basically what he's saying. Because if he's not effectual in giving the gifts then it's not really a high view of a, the gift giver. It's a low view of the gift giver in his mind. And for what reasons I just discussed, that's not, there's not, that's not true in any other walk of life. It's not intuitively true. It's only true within the Calvinistic framework. And it's a kind of a post ad hoc rationalization to make their system sound as positive as possible. And again, I, I know that that's not what he, he sees it as, but this is what my accusation is, is the reason that they have to paint the gift giving as if it's effectual in order for it to be a high view of gift giving, a gracious, the really gracious view of gift giving is because they're trying to make their view seem as attractive as possible, as, as plausible as possible. And, and, and when you really paint it out though, when you really look at the other side behind the curtain, so to speak, of the claims of Calvinism, you, you have to go to the other side, the dark side of the Calvinistic system, which is what? Anyone who doesn't believe, anyone who doesn't respond positively, it's because this grace wasn't given to them or wasn't provided for them. So what are what are the reprobates, the non-elect, rejecting? They don't have a provision of atonement on, on Calvinism, so they're not rejecting that. They're not rejecting a God who loves them because on Calvinism, God doesn't salvifically love them. In fact, the God 
that the reprobate is rejecting is a God who first rejected the reprobate in eternity past when he chose to create him for destruction as doom from the womb, as Calvin called it. And so the dark side of Calvinism, which these guys don't spend a lot of time talking about the dark side of unconditional election, and I'm pointing it out, and this is where they'll get you a real, oh, you don't understand Calvinism. And they'll get really angry. Why? Because you're pointing out the ugly side of their system in a real clear way from a reasonable person who's not hatred and I'm not vitriolic and I'm not shouting them down, but a, but a kind person who loves them and cares about them, who's demonstrated that I do care about these, these gentlemen and I, and I love Calvinist and then I'm calm about it. And I just say, okay, the dark side of your system is that the reason that people don't believe God on your system is because God didn't want them to. He didn't really love them. He created them for destruction. They didn't have any control over it. This is beyond their control. Whether you're a reprobate or elect, it's beyond your control on your system. You have nothing to do with it, ultimately. No more than the color of your eyes, the color of your skin, anything else that is just a, a natural feature of yours from birth. And the reason we abhor racism so much is why. I know, Jeff, you abhor racism. Why do you abhor it so much, Jeff? Because you're being, you're being judged for the content, not of the content of your character, but for the color of your skin, something you have no control over. But yet on Calvinism, you have no more control of the color of your skin than you do the content of your character. Because ultimately you're born in this dead-like in, uh, immoral condition from birth by decree that you can't help. And you will always reject and hate the things of God, no matter how clearly proclaimed they are in front of your eyes, because God decreed for you to be that way from birth and you could not help it. And when you see and clearly lay out the other side of Calvinism and see how ugly that other side is, that's when people begin to go, whoa, 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 whoa. What, what, are you, what is my pastor teaching me here? What is he really saying? And this is why people within your congregation, this is why throughout church history, since the time this was first introduced by Augustine, this has been one of the most controversial issues within the church. Because when people begin to see the full scope of what Calvinism is claiming, they begin to recognize that it's painting God as duplicitous, as at least sounding like he really desires, at least offering like he really wants people to come, but secretly behind the scenes, before the foundation of the world, he has chosen some people to be his elect and other people to, to be reprobate that cannot even respond positively to the plainly spoken truth placed in front of them for reasons completely beyond their control. And that is a system I don't think the Bible teaches. And the reason we're standing against it is because we don't believe the Bible teaches it. Not just because emotionally it's difficult to, to swallow, not just because uh, we're, we're uh, you know, being purely emotional and just anti-Calvinist or whatever. We're standing against this either because it's wrong or because God has ordained us to. Those are the only two real options. If, if Christianity is true and God is real, the only two real options is we're either standing in defense of God's glory freely and rightly, or God has determined us to stand against Calvinism for the praise of his own glory, for reasons that we just don't know. He has morally sufficient reasons for why he would decree some of his children to create broadcast coming out against determinism, and yet he's determining us to do that. And I see no rational answer or explanation as to why God would do such a thing. And so we have done the sovereignty of God. Uh, we talked about, uh, and we got this from Pastor James, like it, it, TULIP is the is the acrostic, the, however you use it, it uh, T-U-L-I-P, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. It, James has said it really should be stulip, um, you know, the an S, because the S is the, is the guiding thing there, mm -hmm. the sovereignty of God, the rule of God, the control of God over all things. So we did that, we did total depravity. And that's it, where we talk about how they define sovereignty as being determinism, but sovereignty means uh, ruler or king. And God has the right to rule however he pleases, which includes, in our estimation, his ability to create a world with libertarianly free creatures. He has the sovereign right to do that as a sovereign, is to give creatures libertarian freedom, which we believe he does. So to say God's sovereign is not uniquely Calvinistic, just so you know. And total depravity is sometimes often, it's called? Total inability. Total inability. Mm -hmm. And it really speaks to the ability of a fallen person in Adam. What are their abilities? How dead are they? Are they spiritual? Okay, before you even get there, though, you have to also talk about the ability of Adam to resist the temptation. Because if God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, then that means he also decreed Adam's fall. And we've even provided quotes from Calvin and other Calvinists who also admit that, yes, God did decree for Adam to fall, meaning that he could not have done otherwise. He could not have willingly chose to do otherwise. And so, therefore, you have still no basis on which to really uh, 
found the concept of human culpability on on their worldview. Now, there's some softer forms of Calvinist that do try to maintain that that Adam and Eve did have the liberty, uh, free liberty, to refrain or not refrain from eating of the forbidden fruit. Um, and then you would just have to ask the question: Well, was God sovereign then? And of course, the Calvinist has is, is now kind of backed himself in the corner and said, "Oh, well, sovereignty means God determines everything." And now I'm asking, is God sovereign in the garden prior to the fall? And of course, they're not going to want to say, no, he wasn't sovereign then. They have to say he was sovereign then. So are you saying that God somehow determined Adam to fall? Well, no, no, no. He had the liberty of the will to do that. Okay, so he wasn't, God wasn't sovereign? See, they, 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 can't, they can't reconcile this. And they, and they know it. And this is why they start pressing back. Ah, you don't understand. Well, we've already answered this. Well, no, different Calvinists answer that different in different ways. There's not one monolithic answer, brothers. Calvinists have been varied and have defied it, fought over this issue. That's what the whole Lapsarian controversy fight is all about. And we've played a lot of those different disputes because it reveals the underpinning problem with the entire Calvinistic system when you begin to unpack those issues. Spiritually sick. Are they able to seek for God? Are they able to believe? Um, these are the questions that are asked. Um, you know, uh, what really separates the Reformed from really all other religions is a consistent perspective in terms of what the Bible says about the condition of a sinner in this world, um, how... The condition of the sinner in this world, anthropology, uh, we, we've had several broadcasts on anthropology where I've gone through some of the leading scholars on different, various views. By the way, it's mo monolithic among reformers either with regard to inherited guilt, as we've talked about in previous episodes, that Luther called Zwingli a Pelagian because Zwingli did not believe in inher inherited guilt, and he had a differing view of that and, and of the fall and the effects of the fall. And so this has been a debate even among reformers uh, and reformed theologians throughout history. Uh, so don't 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 let Calvinists fool you into thinking that you know John Piper's view of Calvinism is the only view out there. There's there's actually various views among Calvinists regarding these issues as well. And and I'll, I'll just point out that the Bible talks about being sick or ill or infirmed more often than it does even being dead. And so that those are all an analogies of what it means to be separated from God. And as we've pointed out, uh, the prodigal was said to be lost, but now he's found, dead, but now he's alive, meaning he was separated due to rebellion, not that we, he was totally incapable of humbling himself and coming home, which obviously is what he did. Uh, the church in Sardis said to be dead, but now they're alive. They'll wake up and renew what remains. Obviously, it doesn't mean they were unable to, to heed Christ's warning there. Calling somebody dead doesn't mean you're completely innate immorally uh, speaking speaking in the sense you can't respond because even calvinists recognize that the word dead doesn't always connote that meaning in scripture even they believe you a dead man walks in darknesses darkness and responds negatively and corpses don't do any kind of response it would be uh, passive uh, cogs they wouldn't do anything they just lay there the fact that 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 um, lost people can respond with vitriol or they can uh, be very laissez-faire about it and just not care. Uh, they can show interest for a long time and then end up walking away. They can have all kinds of different responses, which is different than what a corpse would obviously do. So even Calvinists admit that there's an idiomatic aspect of the deadness that's talked about within Scripture. The question is, what does dead mean in its context? And so when the Bible speaks about us being dead and being made alive, we agree with all of that. But what does that mean in context? Well, it means you were separated from God and you're raised with him to new life through faith. And so it's through faith that we're made alive with Christ and, and, and brought together back and reconciled with him. And so faith is, is what's needed in order to bring us back from our uh, enmity and our separation. We need to be reconciled. We need to be brought back. And so the solution to being dead is what? Believe in Jesus so that you may live. The Bible says this over and over and over again. You come to Christ, you eat of Christ, you drink of Christ's blood in order that you may live, not that I'll make you alive unilaterally so that you'll certainly eat and drink and come to Christ. It never gives that, that qualification. So again, we have to look at the biblical order of what, what where, how we get life. We get life by coming to the life giver, Christ. You're not unilaterally just given life so that you'll come to the life giver. No, that's the wrong order. You come to the life giver in order to get life, not the other way around. Oh. What are, their, what are their spiritual abilities? Do they seek for God? Is there anyone good? Um, are they able to come to Jesus apart from the drawing of the Father? Um, can they do what is pleasing in God's sight while they are in the flesh and not? And I think I would answer all those questions the same exact way he would, just so you know. 
regenerate? Is that even possible? And so we did total inability. If you well, now, now that you put the word regenerate in there, that's that's the order that I was talking about. But with refer refer as the other things, can you be righteous on your own? No, uh, obviously not. No one's righteous. No, not one. Does that mean you can't uh, confess your unrighteousness and trust in the righteous one? No, and and that's what James, that's what James White and Jeff Durbin and some of the other Calvinists seem to assume that because no one's righteous and believing in Jesus, that would be righteous. So therefore, you can't do it. They think that's what Paul's ultimately arguing in Romans three. No one's righteous, no, not one. And believing in Jesus, that would be righteous. So you can't do that. It's basically the, the logic of their flow of thought. And that's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying no one is righteous in accordance with the law. Therefore, your only hope is to put your faith in the righteous one, Christ. And so that's your only hope, is the righteousness which comes not through the law, but through faith. And so Paul is not trying to say that no one's righteous, no, not one. Believing in Jesus is righteous, therefore no one can do that. That's never where Paul goes with any of his arguments with regard to the righteousness of God. If you, if you haven't seen that, look it up on the channel, look through the live feed, and you'll see the total inability one that we did. Today is unconditional election. Whatever does that mean? <laughs> well, um, in the acrostic tulip, you have total inability, unconditional election. What's that mean? That was aiming, that is aiming at the question of when God chooses to save, on what basis does he do it? Does he do it? How gracious is his grace in election? So you can't get away from like grace, faith, death of Christ, resurrection of Christ. These are things you can't move away from in, in scripture. But you, you also can't get away from things like predestined, mm -hmm. election, called. These are all biblical. Uh... And this is where he and I would agree with each other. And I've said the same thing, because one of my biggest pet peeves is when I hear a Calvinist arguing with a non-Calvinist and the non-Calvinist says something like, well, I don't believe in that predestination and that election stuff. I don't believe God calls, you know, and elects. I, I was like, okay, <laughs> brother, I, I love you, but you don't believe the Bible then. Um, it, 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 the, the concept and idea is what is your doctrine of election? What do you believe about predestination? And what Jeff Durbin believes about predestination is that God is predestined before eternity. In eternity past, God is predestined who will and won't believe in him. And what I believe predestination is about is God is predestined before creation, that all who put their faith in him will have these spiritual blessings that he lays out in Ephesians 1, for example. So you'll be conformed in the image of his son. So God is predestined, destined beforehand, that everyone who puts their faith in Christ will be conformed into his image, will be made holy and righteous. So we both have a doctrine of predestination. I believe in the doctrine of election, okay? I believe God chooses. Um, I, I, Matthew 22 is, is Jesus gives an illustration of the doctrine of election. Many are called, few are chosen. Few are elect, he says. And who are the few are elect in that parable? Those who came in response to the wedding invitation clothed in the right wedding garments. So notice that the, the condition is not their nationality, because remember the invitation went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So it doesn't matter about their nationality. And that, that covers all nations, by the way. The, the word Gentile just means nations that are not Jewish. Okay, so it went first to the Jew and then to all other nations. So it's not conditioned upon your nationality. We also know it's not conditioned on your morality, because remember, he says, send the invitation to the good and the bad alike, to the moral people and the immoral people, send it to everybody. So we know the, 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 the condition is not your morality or your nationality, but what is the condition? Well, the Calvinist says there's no condition. It's just unconditional. We don't know. It's unstated. We don't know the basis on which God chooses people. We just don't know. It's a mystery hidden in the secret counsel of God's will. And that's not what the, the illustration says. The illustration shows us the condition of those who are in, uh, granted entrance into the wedding banquet are those who come in response to the invitation clothed by faith in the righteousness of Christ, the right wedding garments. And so if you come in response to the gospel in faith, clothed in his righteousness, where he doesn't see your filthy rags anymore and your sin and your guilt, he sees the blood of Christ covering you, that's the wedding garments of the king, that he will grant you entrance into his wedding feast if you come in faith, that is the condition to enter in. So you can't say that election is unconditional because Jesus doesn't say election is unconditional. Jesus says it's not conditioned upon your nationality, which a lot of people thought it was back then. And it's not conditioned on your morality, how many laws you keep, which a lot of people thought it was back then. He's correcting those two misnomers. It's not conditioned upon your nationality or your morality. What is the condition there for? Your faith in Jesus. That's the condition for your election. 
Many are called, few are elect. Who are the few are elect? Those who came in response to the gospel, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is a biblical doctrine of, uncon of, of election, which is, yes, unconditioned on morality and nationality, but it's not unconditioned with regard to faith in Jesus. All right, moving on. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, terms, concepts that run throughout the record of redemptive history from Genesis to Revelation, you can't get away from this. And so the, you have to answer it. And the question is, will you answer the question about God's sovereign grace? Will you answer the question about God's choosing and election and predest predestining and calling? Will you answer it based upon some a priori system and understanding and- Yeah, will you? And that's, I would ask Jeff the same question. Would you answer the questions that I pose to you, not based upon a, a priori system of Calvinism or determinism? And so we, we both have presuppositions coming to this argument, to these discussions. And, and they're both, they both have a tradition, okay? Um, and, and so sometimes the Calvinist will just assume that their system is the right one, their a priori conclusions are the correct ones, and therefore you people over there, you Arminians, you provisionists, you people over there, you have the wrong a priori uh, presuppositions. We have the right ones. But they have to be willing to examine their own presuppositions which is what we're trying to call them to do on this broadcast. And the reason I would love to have Jeff on is because I would love to be able to push him on his, his presuppositions, um, as I will White in the debate coming up in March. I will push him on his presuppositions because I think those are foundational to his interpretation of John 6 and others. Um, Solitary Emmy, thank you for your super chat. Is there a chance that grace means that God can withhold it from anyone, even if they trust in Jesus because it's undeserved? but a bonus gift. I'm not sure I'm following that question. I'm not, I'm sure, I'm not sure if you're asking that from the Calvinist viewpoint, I, I'd have to think about that because I'm not sure what, I, I'm not following what you mean by that. And it's probably just uh, a lacking on my part, not yours, but I, sorry, I can't give you more uh, information on that. Niagara Falls, thank you for your super chat. I'm so blessed by this channel. Jeff is a very confident man who doesn't shy away from debates on the street or with atheists. It's perplexing to me that he wouldn't come on your program to discuss. Yeah, I don't know why he doesn't either. I'm sure he has his reasons for for not doing that. But, um, and I'm not trying to assume it's a nefarious reason. He just may be too busy and just not, not want to. But um, he, he has a standing invitation if you'd ever like to come on my show or I'll, I'll come on his if you'd rather. All right. And presuppositions that you pour into that, or will you allow the text of God's word and his revelation just to tell you this is what it's like. Here's how God does it. Will you allow the text to tell you rather than coming in with your preconceived ideas of what is just, what is fair, um, uh, how God should do this? Um, what, will you go and let the text speak or will you go to it and say, well, I don't... Well, this is why I go to the scriptures to define what love is, for example, because people like MacArthur and others say God does love the non-elect. And, and I'll go to 1 Corinthians 13 and I'll define what love is because we have to get our definitions from scripture. So I agree with these principles that he's talking about. We have to go to scripture to find out what grace is. We have to go to scripture to find out what love is. We've got to go to scripture to find out what justice is. We've got to go to scripture to find out what the wrath of God is. We've got to go to scripture to find out what faith is. All of us believe that. And, and so the question is, is how are you interpreting those texts? And are you interpreting those texts freely or by decree? And, and that if I'm interpreting them wrongly, am I doing so by decree or am I doing so freely? And I think a Calvinist has to grapple with that question. Uh, Solidary Emmy follows up and he says, uh, I meant for salvation like God might be as the Catholics believe they got to do a lot of sacraments and maybe God can show them grace. Um, again, I, I may have to follow up with what you said before to follow in what you're asking. And I'm not sure... Yeah, I, again, I'm not I'm not really sure what you're asking. Maybe I need to see it all together. <laughs> you don't have to send another super chat if you don't want to, because I feel bad. I'm not able to answer your question, but I'm not really following what, what you're asking. Sorry. I don't like this concept of election and predestination and God's choosing. And so I'm going to try to uh, I'm going to try to re recover God's reputation for him because I don't like if I don't like a God who just chooses by a sovereign grace. Well, OK, now, Jeff, just be objective for a second, brother. What if you're wrong? OK, just just uh, I know, you know, we don't think you are. But suppose for a second you're wrong, okay? What is your system doing to God's character if you're wrong? You've got to consider that. And we obviously believe you are wrong. Um, and so we, we, you have to understand how we're seeing Calvinism 
if Calvinism isn't true. In other words, if Romans 9 is not defending Calvinism, then what is? And if, and if it can be shown that Romans 9 is not an apologetic for the Calvinistic system, then why would anyone want to defend a system that even Calvin called dreadful? Um, even, even James, uh, excuse me, John Piper says he wept three days thinking about the dreadfulness of it and the, 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 how Matt Chandler calls it an itchy blanket. Um, one of the guys, the pulpit and pen guy talks about the, the five stages of grief that you go to first coming into Calvinism. I mean, all Calvinists talk about, even Sproul in his own commentary talked about how he was kind of drug kicking and screaming against it. He even talks about saying, well, I'll, I'll accept it, but I don't have to like it. You know, that was his own quote about it. In other words, Calvinists admit how difficult and hard this doctrine is to swallow. And, and, and for right reasons. I mean, because look at what it, it claims about God. It, and, and just suppose for a moment, just suppose, what if it's not true? What if you've gotten your interpretation of Romans 9 wrong, Jeff? Then, yes, you are impugning the character and the goodness of God's provision and love for every single man, woman, boy, and girl. You are. That's just a fact of the matter. I'm not trying to be mean in saying that, Jeff. You are doing that if you're wrong. Now, if you're right, fine. I mean, you're not doing that. But you can't just assume that you're right when addressing that issue. You have to, you have to be willing to see it from our vantage point and say, okay, maybe... Maybe if I've gotten this wrong, the provisionist, the Armenian is right, and I'm actually doing injustice to God and his character and his design and his gospel. And you have to be willing to tread very lightly before you jump right on your conclusions without considering the various interpretations in an in-depth way. And I don't think that you have, based upon how you've responded to us this far, Jeff, I know you think you've done a lot of study on this. But I can tell based upon many of your objections and the way you read some of these verses, um, just matter of factly, you, I don't think you're even aware of how we interpret them. Because if you were aware of how that we would interpret them, at least it seems like you would, to me you would say, oh, well, the, the Armenian or the provisionist thinks it this way, and this is why we would disagree. But no, you just state it as if, oh, see, a la Calvinism, as if we've never read the verses before. And that's just as frustrating when you hear one of those Arminians uh, on Twitter or your Facebook who can't even spell Arminian or Calvinism correctly, and they throw fire at you, quoting John 3.16 at you like you've never heard it before. You know how you, that makes you feel? That's kind of how I feel, Jeff, watching some of your broadcast. When you throw out all these verses at us as if we've never read them before or as if we haven't considered them, and it makes us think maybe you haven't even considered our viewpoint. And it'll become more clear as we go through this, because I'll, I'll answer specifically the verses that you've brought uh, to question. And grace mm -hmm. and his own sovereign will. I don't like a God who does according to his will yeah. among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand and say, what have you done? I don't like a God who declares the end from the beginning. I don't like a God who says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I don't like that. And you did not choose me, but I chose you, John 15, 16, which even your own mentor, Jeff, uh, James White, we have on record showing a video saying that's not about Calvinistic election. That's about God choosing from among his disciples, those who will be his apostles. So choosing from among his followers, those 12 to be his apostles, is not about Calvinistic election unto salvation. It's about the election of the apostles from among his followers. Even James White acknowledges that in one of his broadcasts. And so this, this again, just give you just a real simple illustration of how you can get something wrong based upon your a priori assumptions, assumptions, right? Your Calvinistic assumptions being read into John 15, 16, and you assume that he's talking about Calvinistic election when even your own mentor admits that's not what he's talking about. And so I want it to look a certain way. So I'm going to pour into those texts something else. What do we want to say as reform folks? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Look, there are things in the Bible that make me uncomfortable. They make me uncomfortable. There's a lot of violence in the Bible. I mean, killing a thousand dudes with the jawbone of an ass is violent, right? That's violence. Like what Lot's daughters do with him yeah. is uncomfortable, right? It's, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about. Uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are uncomfortable, but we don't have the... Yeah, when Lot did that, I don't think he was decreed to do that unchangeably by God. So I, I, I call what Lot did, the ancestral relationships that Lot had wrong and sinful and against the will of God. I don't say they're in accordance with his decreative will. Um, and, and something that God sovereignly and unchangeably brought to pass. So that, that's a problem with your view is that you have, you, you are uncomfortable with what those things that you think God decreed in, in eternity past unchangeably. 
and I, and I'm and I'm just saying I don't I don't think that seems to match up with the tenor of scripture and how these things are presented. Have the right to go to the revelation of God and distort it because it goes against my own cultural beliefs or my own traditions or my own theological commitments. What does the Bible say? What do the scriptures say? And so that's where this this is coming from in terms of unconditional election. When God looks, when God saves, and I'll, I'll kick it over to you guys here. When God saves and choose, well, I should say better. When God chooses to save, does He do so? based upon learning something about history and seeing who would believe in him? Like, does God look through time and say, I know that person will believe in me, so on the basis that they've chosen me, I'll choose them. Or that they will choose me, I'll choose them. Or on the basis of the fact that they will come to me, I will then choose them and elect them. Or the basis mm -hmm. that they'll believe in me, or whatever the case may be, like their will will be amenable to, to my grace, and so I'll choose them on that basis. Or, do we take the- Now, we already presented our view of election through the story of, the, of Matthew 22 parable. It's not, it's not conditioned upon their nationality, their morality, but it is conditioned upon them coming in response to the gospel in faith. Um, I, I don't, I think that there's the whole quarters of time perspective that's often propagated out there, but that's usually done by the, the straw meaning of the Calvinist of, of a simple foresight faith, like God peering through the future as if God's bound by time and he's learning things in the same way we would learn it if we had a crystal ball and we're looking into the future or something like that. And that's just obviously... Um, not not the way William Lane Craig or myself or any of the leading Arminian or non-Calvinistic scholars would describe how election works. So again, that's a, that's tend, a, a tending towards a straw manning, though there may be some views of Arminians that have held to something like that at some point. I, I it's not it's not the the most robust of the views of election that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, D Barbecue, thank you for your super chat. Um, he sovereignly put life and death before us. He sovereignly wills that none shall perish. See, we can say sovereign too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, God, God sovereignly chose for us to have a choice. And so, yeah, we, there's no, there's no reason we can't use the word sovereign as well. And from our perspective, take the biblical standard, there is none righteous, no, not one, none, yep. no, no one righteous. Therefore no one can believe in Jesus because that's righteous. That, that's what he's meaning behind that statement. And we're just going, that's not what the Bible says. No one is righteous in accordance with the law. Therefore, their only hope is to trust in Jesus, is what Paul actually teaches. Who seeks for God? None who does good. Do we take that perspective and say, okay, let's just say that God did look through time, or his knowledge of time was such that um, he could look at sinners and see what they would do. Well, what would that mean for humanity? <laughs> it would mean that no one's seeking for God. No one's coming yeah. to God. No one has the ability to come to God, John 6, No one is able to come to me. So on what basis does God choose? Forcing faith? In fact, he knows that they're gonna be a certain way? That's why total inability was so important to get right. Exactly. If you establish the condition of man, right. what he's actually capable of, you understand the necessity of God's free electing sovereign grace. Right. Uh, does God look down through history for choice meat? Right? And decide, well, that's a choice meat, so I'll choose on that basis, or whatever they, whatever excuses people come up with. Or do we take the testimony of Scripture? Okay, and anybody who knows anything about the discussion of her choice meats knows the one minute video that I did write in response to James White, which I know he saw and responded to, and I'm sure Jeff Durbin's probably seen it too, but this is a, a common refrain from non-Calvinists that don't want to represent what we believe in, in our understanding. And here's that, that video if you wanna watch it. The choice meets analogy was in response to R.C. Sproul, who kept using the word choice and elect only in the Calvinistic sense. Some people unfortunately misrepresented my comment, as if I was saying God chooses people based upon their own merit or what they have earned. That is simply untrue. I was using the analogy of choice meats in the same way that Jeremiah 24 uses the analogy of choice figs. These God-fearing people might be referred to as choice people. They're not seen as choice figs or good figs, because of their own merit or righteousness. They are deemed good based upon the righteousness of God in whom they trust. Therefore, when we refer to someone as being choice or good or righteous because they believe in God, we are not saying they are good based upon their own merit or something that they have earned. Instead, we are saying that God considers them righteous, good, choice, on the basis of Christ's merit, not their own. Okay, so I wanted you to see that, to see the difference between what people like Durbin and James White um, erroneously paint my perspective as, as if I'm saying it requires you to be a better human being in order to believe in Jesus. Ironically, they're the ones that believe that. They're projecting in a sense. Because on Calvinism, you have to be regenerated, which means ontologically 
change into a better human being in order to believe in Jesus. So only on Calvinism do you have to be a better human being in order to believe in Jesus. I believe anybody can believe in Jesus. I, I believe anyone and everyone can believe in Jesus. Once they've reached a, an age of accountability where they can understand truth, I believe anyone and everyone. I don't think their nature from birth is keeping them from being able to believe in Jesus, in other words. So I believe anyone can believe in Jesus. They only believe good people can believe in Jesus because regenerate people are better people by definition. Their eyes are open spiritually. They have a new heart. They, they're, they're regenerate. They're born again. So of course they're better. So you have to be regenerated, born again, in order to believe on Calvinism. They believe in choice meets in the sense that they're accusing me of believing it. And I don't believe that. I believe you're considered choice based upon the quality of the one in whom you trust, not based on your own quality. So if someone is called a choice person, a good person, like Enoch was called a good man or righteous man, didn't Jeff just now say, no one's righteous, no, not one? Enoch was righteous. Job was righteous. Simeon was righteous. Did Paul contradict himself? No one's righteous, no, not one. But I just listed from Scripture at least four or five people who are called righteous by God. So how, how do you reconcile that, Jeff? Could it be that they're called choice, righteous, good, because the righteous live by faith? They're called righteous, they're credited as righteous because of the one in whom they trust, not on the base of their own quality, their own goodness, their own inherent worth, or their own righteousness. It's based upon the goodness of the one in whom they place their trust, which is why Paul says in one chapter, no one's righteous, and the very next chapter he says Abraham was righteous. How do you reconcile that if you don't acknowledge the two different forms of righteousness that he's talking about? The righteousness which comes by the law versus the righteousness which comes through faith. Abraham believed and it was credited to him to his account as righteousness. Why? Because he was a better choice, meat, quality human being that was just better than everybody else? No, he was just as sinful as fallen as anybody else around him. What made him considered to be choice? He believed in God. And based upon the quality of the one in whom he trusts, he was credited with the righteousness of Christ. That's what I've always taught and I've always believed. I've never changed my view on that. I taught that in the video clip that they got the Choice Meets thing out of, which I showed to James White and Jeff Durbin, and yet they continue to double down as if I'm trying to say what their view actually is, that a person has to be a better quality human being in order to believe in Jesus. It's not what provisionism has ever taught. It's only what Calvinism teaches, and yet they project their view onto us. Uh, ben, thank you for your super chat. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 9 shows the reason for being chosen in Abraham's covenant from Genesis 15. Nehemiah 7 through 8 shows Abraham was chosen because God found his faith. Uh, Genesis 15. Yeah, and there, there's several examples of that in Scripture that we've gone over in other broadcasts and that I've put out there where just one right after another after another the Psalm 25 passages. Who are the ones who fear the Lord, who believe and humbly trust Him? These are the ones He reveals His way. These are the ones He reveals His covenant to, Matthew 22, uh, excuse me, uh, Psalm 25 says. So who does He reveal His covenant to? Those who believe in Him, those who trust in Him. That's who He reveals His covenant to. And so there's so many scriptures that, 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 that debunk this concept and this idea and, and, and if I had Jeff here in person, I could press him on that. And I could maybe even show him that video or, or give him a quick, a quick explanation of what we, what we mean when we're referring to a choice, a righteous man. We're not trying to say he's merited his righteousness and he's perfect and he doesn't have any sin. No, we're saying he's being credited as righteous in the sight of God because he puts his faith in God. And they don't deserve that. Faith, faith without Christ and the atoning work of Christ is a filthy rag. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't earn anything. Trusting in, in, in God doesn't earn or merit anything. God has to make a way through Christ, through the atoning work of Christ, to pay your debt, which you can't pay on your own. And so trusting in God or trusting in Christ isn't what merits or earns salvation. And, and I, I, I would think that any Protestant would at least understand that because that was part of the, the stance against some of the ills of the Roman Catholic Church were that, that the, the concept and idea that you were somehow earning or meriting your salvation through good deeds and good works. And that's something that no Protestant, none of us, I know I don't believe that. And so for, for him not to understand that, I think demonstrates a little bit more as to why we're having the, this controversy. All right, let me go back to the right view here and move on. Scripture. 
that the wicked go astray from the womb, that we are dead in our sins and trespasses by nature, children of wrath, that we are non-God seekers, we don't do good, and we're unable to come to Jesus. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up, the one the Father draws Jesus. Okay, so much I want to say right there. I'm chomping at the bit, trust me, because I've immersed myself in the study over John 6 because I'm getting ready for my debate. Um, but I am not going to. I, I'm I'm doing my best right now. I've put out a lot of stuff on John 6. I've published stuff on John 6. Everybody knows what my view is already anyway. But I'm holding off on that to encourage you to go and listen to the debate in, on March 7th with James White, where I will cover many of these errors of Calvinism. And I will be doing so live, and I will be able to hold uh, Dr. White responsible for his comments. And I will be able to press him on his presuppositions in a live conversation. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And I'm not going to do that going over everything uh, with, with Jeff in this discussion, because I, I'm going to save that fire for the debate. Raises up. On what basis? Is it something in the creature? Is it according to their will or the flesh? or their own believing, and then God says, okay, I'll choose you on that basis that you really chose me, like that you will choose me. Uh, when God elects, how? This is all work out. Ad yeah, well, I was gonna say, um, I'm glad you brought up that point. I'm just gonna quickly say that what's, what's important to understand if you're new to this conversation is that each one of these points is all connected to one another. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason it's laid out a certain way is because they build upon one another. So you can't just cherry pick these points and have them stand alone I mean, it doesn't make them untrue but they all are connected to one another and they all rise together fall together and that's it's important to understand that that, that is true the entire system as rc sproul argues rises or falls on the t so if you believe everyone is born totally unable to respond positively to the gospel which is what the t teaches then the rest of the systematic kind of falls or hangs on that truth on on that on that doc the truth of that doctrine if it's demonstrated as we've done here several times to be untrue or unbiblical, then the entire system dissipates with it. And I, and I agree with that. It's one of the reasons I've spent so much time arguing over the T of total inability, which I think removes human responsibility to say that somebody is unable to respond is ultimately to say, whether you mean to or not, that they're not responsible because in what intuitive way would anybody hold somebody responsible for something they can't respond to? It, it, it just flies against not only the natural connotation of that word, um, and its root meaning, but it also flies against all intuition and biblical revelation, as far as I can tell. Um, Joshua, thank you for your super chat. I see a lot of people say you're straw manning me, and then they straw man others. I love Jeff, and then I saw I'm um, I'm say free will in air quotes. I like a Calvinist when they don't push Calvinism. Uh, you're doing great stuff, Doctor. Thanks. I um, appreciate that, Joshua. And and uh, yeah, we, we again notice that I am not. I, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, talking about anyone's character. I'm not attacking them in any personal way. I am focusing directly laser focused on their actual claims and their actual views and, and explaining why we would disagree with them. That that's important in these kinds of discussions. And then, well, and, just, and that's a good a way, a way I would express that is you're exactly right. Pastor Luke, um, it, it, that it is a coherent biblical system. Yeah. Yeah. It's a coherent biblical system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ours is coherent as well. Um, and, and the fact that when everybody thinks something that we believe as a provisionist isn't coherent, then I have to assume that they don't understand us because there's nothing incoherent or illogical about what we believe. Um, what is incoherent in the in, inherent within the Calvinistic system is the concept of determinism and human responsibility. I, I don't think that it's possible to say that someone's responsible for something that is determined by factors beyond their control. Um, and we argue that from a philosophical side, but also from a biblical side. And we've had many broadcasts demonstrating how this is the mystery of Calvinism, that even Calvin talks about how he's meditated on these things for so long that he's not afraid to confess ignorance as to how God's not implicated as the author and the prover of transgressions. Um, he, he admits that uh, seeming contradiction, um, what, what J.I. Packer calls an antinomy, which by definition is a contradiction. Um, now, he says it's a seeming uh, contradiction. It, it's not really a contradiction, but it seems like one. And that's why it's not coherent. Uh, just like I mentioned before, it's not coherent in my in my view for for God to decree for me to stand against Calvinism as one of his children. That That's not coherent. Um, coherency is actually a, a viable critique uh, for a systematic. And in other words, if a particular, if there's two possible interpretations of a text and one of them promotes incoherence 
or inconsistency or uh, mysteries that are beyond comprehension, especially ones that tend to paint God in a bad light. And there's another one that doesn't do any of those things. Then I would go with the one that doesn't do any of those things. Uh, more likely they're correct. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're all connected because exactly. I believe the Bible is clear on this. And that's why they all work together so well, because it's, it's a view towards, well, what's the condition of man? How does the grace of God affect that? How does God choose to elect on what basis? And then what did the death of Christ actually accomplish? And what is the Holy Spirit able to do in salvation? Can he be thwarted by the will of man? Yeah, right. And then in terms of when God saves, does the Holy Spirit cause that person? And so that's why we always quote P Pritchett saying free will is not a superpower. Um, saying that man can choose to go for or against God's will is not to say that he can thwart God. If God's will is that we have a free will, then he's not thwarting God's will. That's the quote from A.W. Tozer that we always use, that God in his sovereignty, sovereignly, God in his sovereignty decreed not which choice we'll make, but that we'll be free to make it. And a God less than sovereign would be afraid to grant f creatures that kind of freedom. Uh, Tozer is making a valid point that saying that we have a free choice is not thwarting God's will if it's God's will for us to make a choice that's free. And it's just, that's basic logic. A person to persevere. Does God finish what he has started? Is he able to bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, as Paul says? Um, and so these are all the things that swirl around this whole discussion. But in terms of this discussion of unconditional election, unless you have something you want to throw in. Oh, we're already 30 problems. minutes in? Oh, so, uh, yeah. yeah, go over. We're we'll actually oh, past you're right. that. I'm going to get you guys set here now. We're, we're going to run through a lot of scripture today. I mean, that's really the key. So. The traditions that were contrary to what I believe now, uh, but it was these out here. But just as a resource for you to just like go to a place and just start to dive in, it was the text of God's word that ultimately convinced me. That's where I was. Yeah. I had held to traditions that were contrary to what I believe now, uh, but it was the text that did, that did me. I want to go back. <laughs> yeah, all, <laughs> it's a necessary category in the fallen world. All right, so there is a, and I'm going to give you guys a resource. There's so many of these out here, but just as a resource for you just like go to a place and just start to dive in. It was the text of God's word that ultimately convinced me. That's where I was. Yeah. I had held to traditions that were contrary to what I believe now. So notice he says it's the text of God's word that ultimately convinced me. That's not true, Jeff, because I have the text of God's word too. Okay. And so does every other Arminian and provisionist out there. We all have the same text you do. And we've, and many of them have studied it just as hard, if not harder than you have. Okay. And so the text of God's word is not what convinced you. God sovereign and unchangeably convinced you. We've played Steve Lawson, we've played James White and others saying that the reason people come to Calvinism is because God's opened their eyes to it. So in other words, the, the decisive cause of you beginning a Calvinist and interpreting the scripture Calvinistically is God. And that's the exact, exact same reason that I don't. And you have to rationally explain that. And I don't think that you can. Now, listen, now, it's going to give a resource. Uh, but it was the text that did, that did me in. And uh, so there's there's so many. Here's one. The Calvinist.net um, has a good... The Calvinist.net. Now, I, I would like for all of you to go to the Calvinist.net and accuse them of being one-string banjos, okay? Because the Calvinist.net, along with monergism.com, the Calvinistcorner.com, and about 45 other websites that promote Calvinism, Go accuse them of being one string banjos, <laughs> just to be fair. A good section on verses for unconditional election. And so I'll, I'm going to run through some of these with you so you can go back to them later. And again, there's so many resources like this online. This is just one I just grabbed. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some general verses uh, here uh, regarding unconditional election. And uh, so uh, I'm going to read through some of these. We'll, we'll unpack some of them, but let's, let's think through them together and talk about implications and those sorts of things. Um, uh, Matthew 11, 25 through 30, it says, uh, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus. Okay, so let's, let's, let's think about that verse. It actually, he's using this verse for unconditional election, and yet in the verse, it actually gives conditions. You're hiding it from wise people and you're revealing it to the lowly, the humble, the weak, okay? So in a verse that he's claiming teaches unconditional election, actually list the conditions in the verse. <laughs> this is just, it's amazing to me, brothers. He's listing the conditions in the verse. Think about the context of this. This is Jesus talking to the Father. God, I thank you that you've chosen fishermen like Peter, blue-collar workers, nobodies, no names. You didn't choose the politicians and the lawyers, the people who wore the real fancy robes and, and that run the cities, the Pharisees, the leading Pharisees of the day. You didn't choose those guys. 
Um, and a lot of people think, well, well, he chose Paul. But think, think about Paul's testimony. Paul, Paul was a good Pharisee, yes, but he wasn't one of the key leaders. Um, you had the sty in his eye and was probably a small stature and other thing else based upon his own testimony. Um, and so even, even the choice of Paul was a, is a kind of a weak vessel. God chose, chose weak vessels to be his apostles, to bring his message of redemption to the world. Um, Peter very likely spoke on a third grade level. He definitely wrote on a third grade level based upon if you take Greek. And, and when I took Greek, we loved it when our, when our professor assigned us one of Peter's epistles because they were so much easier to interpret than like Hebrews or, or Paul, for example, because Hebrews, they're written on a collegiate and above level. And, and Peter is written at a third grade below level. Okay. And so Peter is a, is a country bunkin. Okay. He's not an educated man. And for, for Jesus to say something along with his uh, the other apostles, um, Jesus is saying, God, thank you that you've chosen the blue-collar workers, the humble, the, the meek, the mild, the nobodies, and not the wise and learned upper class. That's what he's saying, to be my apostles. Um, and, and look at the way Jeff is interpreting that. He does it just like John 15, 16, which his own mentor, Jeff, uh, Jeff your own mentor, James White, even says is not about un uh, unconditional election on Calvinism. It's about God choosing from among his followers those who will be apostles. In the same way, this verse is not about unconditional election on Calvinism. It's about God choosing apostles, certain messengers, to be given to Christ so that he would train them and commission them to go and spread the gospel. And the people he's choosing are not the wise and learned, but the humble and the meek. That condition is stated in the verse, and yet he's claiming this is a verse teaching unconditional election to salvation. People, do you not... And I know Jeff is a pastor that loves the scripture and loves preaching preaching the scripture. At least he can admit he got John 15, 16 and this passage out of Matthew wrong in their context. At least you can recognize, if nothing else, those aren't very good passages to go to to teach Calvinistic's un, uh, Calvinistic version of unconditional election because neither of them are even talking about Calvinism's version of unconditional election in context. Jesus calls that the gracious, gracious will of the Father, that he's hidden it from some and given it to others. Why would you hide something from to somebody who's totally dead and unable, like you believe, from birth? What's the purpose of hiding it? Why speak to them in parabolic language and hide it from them? Why does he weep over Jerusalem saying, if only you would have known what is revealed to you on this day, but now it's been hidden from your eyes? What's he talking about? Do you hide something from dead people? You don't need to hide things from dead people. Dead people can't see. They can't hear. They can't understand. They can't believe. The reason he's using parabolic language, speaking to the hardened Israelite Pharisees, is to hide his identity to ensure that the cross comes to pass. Just like he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and following, these things were hidden from the leaders of that day. Otherwise, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, in order to bring about his purpose and his plan, he's keeping the Pharisees, the leaders, the wise and learned in the dark. He's hiding it from them. These are the same people, many of which who cry out, crucify him, who later at Pentecost come to faith. 3,000 in number of the Jews that come in faith on that day. Many of those who, same, the same ones who cry out, crucify him, are the ones who actually come to faith later. But the reason they're not seeing Jesus as their Messiah at this time is because it's being hidden from their eyes. This hiddenness, this messianic secret that's referred to at times, um, Mark 9, 9, for example, and it says they're coming down from the mountain tra of transfiguration. And he says to them, don't tell anybody what you've seen today until the Son of Man has been raised up, which goes right along with John 12, 32, that when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. In other words, I'm not doing that yet. Right now, I don't want you to tell anybody because the time has not come for everyone to know all these things. I am revealing myself to a select few. I'm hiding it from the rest. Why? To accomplish redemption. And when you understand that Calvinism just disappears, like paint off a canvas when you splash water on it. It just disappears when you understand the context of what these passages are actually addressing. Jesus is the incarnate God. He says that's the gracious will of God, to hide it from some and then give it to others. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That's a, it's a good springboard See, no, point. Notice, notice he just kind of goes, see, Calvinism, 
Notice uh, you, for those of us by audio can't see his face. He just reads the verse and just kind of gives this look like, see, that has to be Calvinism. He doesn't, he doesn't even realize how we would interpret that verse. He doesn't even realize that even Calvinistic exegetes admit that John 15, 16 and passages like this are about God's choice to reveal to certain people uh, to be as apostles and to reveal the light and the truth to them temporarily while hiding it from others temporarily. Um, and so Jeff, Jeff just seems to not even recognize that that's an interpretation because if he did recognize it was an interpretation, at least it seems like he would confront that interpretation instead of just kind of throw up his hand and go, see, must be Calvinism. I think one of the most helpful ways to think about this too is whose will is ultimately decisive for salvation. Yeah. Is it God's or is it the creatures? Right. Whose mm. will is the decisive element of God's will is a decisive in salvation, but you're conflating the choice of God to save with the choice of the man to repent and to believe. You can't, you can't conflate those two choices as if they're one choice and call them both salvation. Okay, brother. And that's what you're doing. Um, it's, it's the father's choice alone to restore the son when he returns home from the pigsty. Nobody's making him do that. He's not being caused to do that. He doesn't have to do that. The, 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 the son certainly doesn't deserve it. And, but, but it is monergistically, if you will, it is solely and only the choice, the decisive choice of the father to save his son, to restore his son, to kill the fatted calf, to give him the golden ring. Monergistically, unilaterally, only the choice of the father. The fact that he chooses to do that for those who return home in humiliation is his prerogative. And it's totally his choice. He doesn't have to do it. So if you conflate the choice of man to sin and repent of that sin with the choice of God to provide atonement and to save the, the repentant sinner, then you get these kinds of false dilemmas that the Calvinists paint, and we just have to point it out to them. Determining whether someone is saved or not. And yeah. for those who would say the Bible is clear in terms of this point, we would say it's God's will that is ultimately the free will. Right. The, the, the ultimately sovereign will in that he saves on the basis of his own good pleasure. Yes. In the same way that he does what he pleases in all of creation, right? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Mm -hmm. That principle is just taken and applied to. Yes, which is Psalm 115, three. He does what all he pleases. That's sovereignty. It's great. Verse 16, if you go on reading, it says the heavenlies belong to the father, but the earth he has given over to man, which seems to suggest there's some sense of autonomy uh, for man to have at least some level of dominion and rule on this earth. The, Ephesians 6 talks about the rulers and authorities in this world, principalities, uh, that, that rule for a time that God's apparently given some sense of authority, some sense of power. Um, none of us are arguing that that power can thwart God or that, can, that God's worried about that power or that God can't um, manage when people have authority or power in this world. But the Bible clearly indicates that God does give over to man, humanity, this earth, which is why we pray, God, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. A prayer that seems somewhat superfluous, if nothing else, if God's will is meticulously always being carried out exactly as he's decreed it to be in every minute way, like the Calvinistic system uh, entails. The destiny of his creatures mm -hmm. in this regard. Yes. And so the simple statement of unconditional election is that God himself demands certain conditions, but he himself satisfies the conditions by grace. Yeah. Grace is the means by which he satisfies those conditions. And he... So he has a condition of faith, but he satisfies that condition by making you believe is basically what he's arguing. Um, so my question has always been, well, then why not just do that with a law? If, if the law is what's required to be righteous, why not just pick certain people and make them satisfy the condition of following the law? Just create some perfect people, make them satisfy the condition of following the law their entire life, and let that be salvation is that God apparently requires the condition of being righteous by living according to his law perfectly. Why not just unilaterally make a bunch of 10% of the world, whatever you want, and make them all perfect law followers? It, see, this is the problem when you equate faith with just another law, like the Calvinists tend to do, um, as, if, as, as if believing in God is just another commandment. You know, the 11th commandment, thou shalt believe in Jesus. And you can't do that any more so than you can refrain from lying or stealing or anything else because it's just another commandment that you can't do. And the truth of the matter is what the scripture is saying is no one's perfect. Everyone falls short. Therefore, your only hope is to believe in the one who is perfect. 
And the Calvinist steps along and goes, ah, well, you can't even believe in the one who's not, uh, who is perfect unless he picks you before you were born and re recreates you into a, a better human being. And once he recreates you into a better, ontologically better human being, then you can believe the gospel because they're the ones who believe in choice meets. You have to be a better quality human being, one who is choice and made into a better quality human being through regeneration, and then you will believe in the gospel. And that's just not a biblical concept. I believe anyone can believe the gospel because that's the way God made us. He elects according to an action in eternity past, right? So this is of ancient times, before creation. Ephesians 1 says, before the foundations of the earth were laid, mm -hmm. right? God did this. He elected you unto, unto eternal life. He chose you in him, mm -hmm. in Christ. This was an action that God... You weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world. You didn't exist before the foundation of the world. Only Christ. Christ is the preexistent one. You don't get in, you don't get in, being in Christ is unity with Christ. That's uh, every, every scholar, I think even Calvinistic scholars admit everything. I even got a quote from White saying that being in Christ is referring to the unity we are with Christ, the unity we have with Christ. You don't have unity with Christ before creation because you don't exist before creation. The only time you have unity with Christ when you're marked in him is when you hear the gospel and you believe, Ephesians 1.13. So when you believe the gospel, you're marked in him. You're not marked in him before the foundation of the world. Like I said, you don't, you don't pre-exist eternally. Only God does that. Christ is the pre-existent one. He's the chosen one. And so you're only elect or chosen insofar as you are in the chosen one, Christ. And so when you unify yourself with the elect, one, Christ, you are elect in him. That's our view of election. Now, many Calvinists don't even know that view of election. It's called the corporate view of election is what it's sometimes referred to. And what most Calvinists think when they hear the corporate view of election, at least this is what I used to think, is that God just chooses a nameless, faceless group and um, and then it's it's uh, that based upon a foreseen faith thing or something of that nature, and you'd make it into this weird category, and you would say something like, "Well, corporations are made up of individuals too," as if that's addressing the corporate view of election, and it's not. Um, if you understand the corporate view of election, you understand that it's in it's it's the federal headship concept that under Adam we are all sinners, under Christ we are all declared righteous, not based upon our own quality choice mate but based upon his quality, okay? So you're declared righteous by grace through faith. So by putting your faith in Christ, you are unified with Christ. You're not unified with Christ before the foundation of the world, as this interpretation would seem to suggest. God undertook in the past according to his own divine decree, which is another word that comes up a lot in reform circles. God has a decree. There is a infinitely wise and holy counsel that God maintains for himself. Sovereign determination. So and, yeah. and he doesn't take into account our counsel to determine what mm -hmm. he will or won't do. Mm -hmm. And that's what really bothers the creature, yeah. is that God mm -hmm. isn't waiting for your input. And it bothers the creature because God sovereignly and unchangeably decreed it to, which again is not rational, tenable, and there's no biblical passage which teaches this quote-unquote sovereign determinative decree. Um, you, you have to read them into obscure texts uh, that can be easily explained in other ways, like Ephesians 1.11, where God is presently actively working things together for good, uh, where he's bringing about his good purposes and his plans for those who love him, as Romans 8, 28, which is a parallel to uh, Ephesians 1, 11, by the way, that God can work out, presently actively work out good. It does not mean God determines every evil thought, action, and deed of all of creation. And uh, it's, it's, it's absurd, in my estimation, to take those passages to mean a, there is a sovereign, unchangeable decree, determinism, uh, before the foundation of the world. This is not a biblical concept as far as I can tell anywhere. Input. Right. This is an action he's already decided upon before the foundations of the earth were laid. Mm -hmm. And the actions that he takes are that he bestows grace to whom he pleases and he withholds it as he pleases. Right, and, and this is really important. That's a perfect- And we all agree that he can bestow grace as he pleases and withhold it as he pleases. Uh, the Bible just tells us who he's pleased to bestow grace upon and who he's not. <laughs> these are the ones I'll have, a, these are the ones I look on with favor those with a contrite heart who tremble at my word, uh, Isaiah 66, 2. So we don't have to guess as to whom he looks on with favor and whom he d d chose to give his grace to. The Bible tells us dozens of times, not just like once or two like, little obscure verse, over and over and over and before you, I set life and death, choose life. This is not too difficult for you, De Deuteronomy 30 even talks about. And Paul quotes that over in Romans chapter 10 and reflects on how that is the very word of God that I've spoken to you, the gospel that we've preached, that he actually references 
that gospel being preached in Deuteronomy 30 as the same gospel that he's referencing in Romans chapter 10. It can't be any more clear uh, in, in my estimation as to what scripture is talking about when it, and it's laying this out for us. Perfect point. He withholds it from whom he pleases and he gives it to whom he pleases. Mm -hmm. Well, the text here says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. For such was your... You've hidden it from the wise and learned. Okay, who's that? Pharisees, leaders, you've hidden it from them. Why would you need to hide it from them, by the way, if they're totally depraved in the dead like way that you think they are? And you've revealed it to children, in the words, babes, nobodies, little people, weak people, timid, okay? Uh, that's, that's that's the vernacular, the idiom of to, to little ones or, or to, to the meek. Um, that's a condition. So in other words, he's making certain ones his apostles who are nobodies. That's the, the clear indication of that text, as far as I can tell in the context. It was your gracious will. And someone goes, that doesn't sound gracious to me. You've got these people over here that he, he, he hides it. He hides it from them. That's not fair. And he gives it to little children <laughs> over here. That's not really fair. And when you so, say- See, if you interpret it Calvinistically, that's exactly what you come up with. That's not fair. That's arbitrary. That's, that's, but if you interpret it the way I do, what do you think? Oh, that makes perfect sense. Go God. Yeah, you're hiding it from fair, from lawyers and Pharisees. Yeah, God, that makes sense. And you're revealing it to country bunkins, blue collar workers that are just humble and meek and mild that that are zealous for you, but don't know who you are yet. Who need to know more truth that, that yeah, they're stumblers. They're, they're just like me. They're, they're just like all of us. And I can relate to Peter and I can relate to, to James and John and these guys because they're, they're just like me. Man, when I read that scripture, I go, whoa, man, that's a good God. I love the fact that he's hiding it from the lawyers and revealing it to the, uh, the, the blue collar workers and nobodies. Boy, I love that about my God. See, when I interpret the verse, I come away going, God looks good and this is great and there's nothing unfair about this and this is wonderful. When Jeff Durbin looks at that verse, he even admits, that makes God look arbitrary and unfair. Why? Because he's misinterpreting the text. Please hear this, brothers say that's not exactly. fair yeah. what you're not understanding is that actually jesus is god incarnate in the flesh stepping into history to bring about redemption for for his people and he's referring to people that are in the same camp the wise and understanding and the little children all are one lump all sinners they're not morally neutral now mm -hmm. if we agree with that just like the jews and the gentiles in acts 28 they're all sinners and what does jesus say or what does paul say in that context Go to the Jews and tell them they're ever seeing and ever perceiving, ever hearing and ever understanding because their heart has grown calloused and hardened. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see, hear, understand, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles because they will listen. What's he done? He's contrasted the Jew with the Gentile. Are they all sinners? Just like Jeff is saying right here, aren't they all sinners? Yes, they're all in the same boat of being sinners. But what is the distinction between the two groups of people? One have become old wineskins, self-righteous, hardened, callous. They've closed their eyes. The others are still in a condition where they can hear and listen, just like children being drawn up out of a crowd. The weak, the meek, the mild, they're still moldable. Those guys over there, those wise and learned, those guys are set in their ways. They're old wineskin that can't take the new wine. They are being temporarily blinded in their rebellion so as to bring about crucifixion through them. But the moldable ones, the weak ones, I'm going to use them for my, my purpose and my plan because they're still moldable. The Gentiles will listen, as Acts 28, 28 says. And he's acknowledging that very same truth that I'm acknowledging, but he's not seeing how that actually destroys his Calvinism. Because on Calvinism, everybody is in a state of inability unless they've been chosen for salvation and unilaterally changed into a new human being. So what, is the, what does it matter if they're an old you know, stick in the mud that become hardened and rebellious. What matter if they're a, a self-righteous Israelite or a, a average child? On Calvinism, either you're elect or you're not. You're a reprobate or you're not. And none of those external factors matter one iota. Why, why does he say it's different, difficult for a rich man to, to enter the kingdom of heaven? No more difficult than anybody else to enter the kingdom of heaven on Calvinism. He's, either he's elect or he's not. If he's unilaterally changed into a different human being, it doesn't matter how much money he has is in his pocket. What, what does it matter how old or how young he is? Yet on, on, on biblical Christianity, based upon the revelation of Scripture, heaven is made up of people like children who are moldable and meek and mild and able to be taught and moldable.
because that is a different condition. And it seems like Jeff just doesn't recognize that distinction. These wise and understanding people that Jesus refers to were somehow in themselves righteous, right? Or they were just 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 clamoring and trying to crawl to God and God's like, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope, no thanks. Well, yeah, if they're morally neutral or something like that, it's like, well, yeah, that does that, that does seem kind of inconsistent and, and, and unfair. Yeah. The problem is that the wise and understanding of the little children are all part of this mass of humanity. They're all fallen rebels, sinners, haters of God. And so when Jesus is... Where's your evidence for that? Where, where's your evidence that that child he pulls out of the crowd is a hater of God? People aren't just born haters and angry at God. People can grow into that kind of uh, reality by rejecting his truth. I, I raised four children. I can't remember any of them uh, in, in, their, in their natural condition, in their natural state. Just I, I, wasn't my testimony and me growing up of just having this hatred, vitriol, angry towards God. No, people can grow into that condition if they continually rebel and reject his truth. And yes, people can be in enmity with God in the sense that they love their sin and their own righteousness, but that doesn't have anything to do with this concept or idea that they can't confess that fact in light of the gospel when it's plainly taught to them. Jesus is saying, I, and God's chosen to reveal it to these little children, and that's his gracious will. That's his gracious will, his choosing. I will give you grace. Mm, yep. All sinful, wise and understanding, little children, all sinful, but I'm giving it to you, such as the Father's gracious will. As if the condition of them being children, i.e. humble, moldable, weak, meek, is not a condition. You're, you're using this verse to teach unconditional election while stating the condition that the verse itself gives them. They're weak. They're moldable. Th that's a condition, Jeff. Well, that's because all of them deserve the same thing. Hell, all of them are on the same level that's ground. That's All rebellious. Yeah, that's the point, is yeah. it's not on the basis of desert. Right. 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 Just like Jews and Gentiles, whether they're hardened or not yet hardened, all deserve punishment for their sins. They're all sinners. No one is worthy of salvation. The prodigal on his home way home doesn't deserve what he's about to get with the golden calf, uh, the golden ring and the fatted calf being restored by his father. He doesn't deserve that on the basis that he's coming home. Nobody's saying that anybody deserves this or it's merited this, okay? And so when you make, make those kinds of arguments, you're not realizing the system in which you're critiquing, in my estimation. Right, and I don't mean dessert like what you eat. Yeah, I was right. looking at donuts. I'm okay. talking about what you have coming to you. Right. The Bible's clear about what you have coming to you. The wages of sin is death. Yeah. If you don't have Christ and you're not in him from before the foundation of the world, then you're gonna get your paycheck down to the last penny. See, it seems like he's arguing that you're in Christ before the foundation of the world, as if you exist in Christ before you're ever created. And that's not a biblical concept, nor, nor is that consistent with every, at least reform exegete and the way they take that passage. Um, it's not until in time that you come to believe that you're marked in Christ or that you're considered unified with Christ. You don't have unity. I mean, how, how could Ephesians 2 be true if you're walking in the darkness and under the wrath of God and also be in Christ at the same time? It doesn't make any sense. You're, 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 you're separated from Christ, but you're unified with Christ all at the same time? If you're, if you're an, an elect person who hasn't yet come to faith, are you saying that you're unified in Christ already and you're also walking in the darkness apart from Christ? Again, you, you have to have two kinds of everything again uh, in that kind of system in order to make that work. Yeah, that's the message of scripture is this is your natural estate and it takes the grace of God to rescue you from that estate. Um, and obviously that happens in time, but divine election, sovereign election is a choice that God undertakes mm -hmm. apart from our input. Um, it's not drawn by some you know foreseen reaction, response or activity of the elect, like you pointed out. Mm -hmm. God's not looking down the quarters of time to see who will and won't believe in him or trust in him, mm -hmm. or you know, did this guy have a really good smile and this, this was this woman intelligent? Mm -hmm. It's not on the basis of uh, a deserving aspect whatsoever, I think which also militates against our present apostate age tremendously because everyone has such a sense of entitlement, mm -hmm. right? I'm owed this, oh, I yeah, deserve yeah. this. Yeah. And you have to come to a point where you acknowledge something. If God deals with us on the basis of mercy, that means that he owes me nothing. Everything that I have, is a result of his free and gracious condescension. Mm -hmm. He does not owe me one gospel sermon mm -hmm. to believe. That's right. Not one. Yeah. And yet he did it. Yeah. And we praise him for that and we marvel. That's why we, it's to the praise of his glorious grace. Mm -hmm. But it's not on the basis, our, 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 the cry of our heart should never be, Lord, give me what I've earned. Mm -hmm. It's give me what Christ has earned. Right. That's exactly the point. Well, I was just going to say, well, we all agree with that. And we wouldn't say, give me what Christ has earned unless he picked us unilaterally before we were born and changes us into a choice meat, causing us to believe that. And so that that's why I think that you have to push back against that. The only reason you can cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, 
is if you're a choice meat first, you're tr turned into a better quality human being first uh, on, on Calvinism. And that's, that's, that's not a biblical concept. Anyone and everyone can turn to Christ so as to be saved. And therefore, that's what's so tragic about hell is that no one has to go there. It, everyone has the opportunity and the means by which they can be saved. And the tragedy of hell is that people are rejecting a provision of a loving, gracious God who has provided a way of atonement, yet they're, they're neglecting that. They're rejecting that. And they're at fault for that. They're not rejecting a God who hated them and never provided anything for them. To say, I think it, this just goes back to the garden. The whole pushback against this goes back to the garden. Like, that's not fair. I can eat. I can't eat from that tree. Like, that's not fair. You know, and the point is that everyone wants their little slice of autonomy. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's what this is about. Inherent. Do they want it autonomously, Luke? Or did God decree them to want their own slice of autonomy? Probably humanity. Yeah. yeah. It goes back to the right to the garden. And so that's, that's the ultimate issue here is everyone wants, they want to have their part in salvation. And, and those, again, that are pushing back against this position, it's like, well, no, I, I, I said the prayer, you know, I accepted Jesus into my heart. I, I did something. And and that's what we're saying is, uh, -uh this is all God. Yeah. He, he only, There's no partnership. If here. you believe in Jesus, it's only because he opened your eyes. Exactly. So you could, you wouldn't have been seeking. In other words, you were a choice meat. So God made you a better human being by opening your eyes, i.e. regenerating you to cause you to believe the truth so as to be saved. So you're, you believe in the choice meats that you're accusing me of believing by saying that the only reason that someone believes in Jesus is because they're a better, better quality human being. They were chosen before they were created. They were regenerated, making them into a better quality human being. But seeking them um, any other way. Right. So it's just more in terms of we can unpack all these in context, but let's just run through strings of verses and then have some explanation in terms of God choosing to save and how gracious is his grace. Matthew 22, 14, yeah. for many are called, but few are chosen. John 6, 37. Many are called, but few are chosen. That's the Matthew 22 parable. Who are the few who are chosen? Those who come in response to the invitation dressed in their wedding garments. How does that prove unconditional election, Jeff? It, the election is in the passage and the conditions are listed. They came in response to the invitation clothed in the right wedding garments. It actually shows you the condition and yet you're using it for a, an unconditional election verse. Yes, it, it, I, I agree that it teaches that it's not conditioned upon your nationality or your morality, but it does not teach unconditional election. Seven, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Mm -hmm. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I have said for years that if you want to see the doctrines of grace um, in uh, um, a discourse from Jesus, uh, read John That's 6, yeah. uh, read John 10. If you want the doctrines of grace uh, enunciated or explained by Jesus. Now I know people are like, well, doctrines of grace were you know, uh, formulated later and explained later. That's not the point I'm making. I'm the, the, the teaching and the principles and all that we're saying in the doctrines of grace are taught by the Lord Jesus. For example, in John chapter six, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Now, this is really important. Jesus teaches in John 6. Oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, um, I just asked Pastor James, uh, Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White is debating this text against uh, Leighton Flowers. Uh, you guys may remember the Leighton Flowers debate with James White from years ago. If you haven't seen it yet, you should see it. It's in Romans 9. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you just need to see it. Uh, Dr. White, uh, just, it just who's being consistent? Who's actually exegeting the text? And so uh, I, I was surprised, actually, that uh, uh, Leighton wanted to do this, uh, so I'm glad he is. John 6 uh, is the topic, um, and uh, it's at First Lutheran Church in Houston, March 7th, James White versus Leighton Flowers. Okay, I'm so, so excited for that. I'm okay, so one, why would he be surprised that I want that since I've been asking for James White to come on the program and I have requested this discussion and f previous debates dozens upon dozens of times for him finally accepting this one from Pastor Evan there at the First Lutheran Church. So this 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 demonstrates to me that what's being communicated to avid followers of James White is that at least his his pastor and those closest to them, they have this mentality that Leighton was scared after the Romans 9 debate would never want to debate James White again, when in reality, I not only divide, invited James White right after the debate is over to come in on the program and have further discussions in order to unpack some of the obvious misconceptions that he drew and the obvious fact that he wasn't following my exegetical commentary through the passage, all of which I actually covered more verses than he did, as we demonstrated by looking at the actual slides on uh, the screen that don't play on his video, but play on mine, where you can see the verses that I'm commenting on as they go up on the screen. And I show all his commentary right next to my commentary of each of the verses. And that I actually comment more on the verses in Romans nine, because he spent so much time in chapter eight 
that he didn't get to chapter into chapter nine until about five, 10 minutes into his, his opener. Whereas I started in Romans nine. And so I actually cover more verses. I actually, if you mean by exegete comment, give your commentary on verses in the chapter. I actually did more than he did, uh, demonstrably. Now you may not followed it because you don't understand my perspective. And, and again, it doesn't sound like to us, it doesn't sound like a Calvinist is exegeting the text either because they're, they're talking about things that we don't agree with. And when you have certain presuppositions coming into a particular passage, it, it, it's very confusing when someone else is describing it from a different worldview or a different perspective. And it sounds like they're talking about a different topic because they're not talking about the topic that you think the passage is about. But you can't beg the question by assuming that, well, chapter nine is about this. And therefore, if Leighton talks about that, then therefore he must be talking about something other than chapter nine. That's just question begging. You can't assume that. And you also can't assume that a person in a debate can't question the presuppositions of their uh, their opponent. You have certain presuppositions uh, that you're bringing to the text. And if I can't challenge those presuppositions, then what's the point of the debate in the first place? The, the point is to say the reason you're interpreting it wrongly is because of this presupposition. And I have every right to challenge your presupposition that's leading you to that conclusion, which is where I spent much of my time in really focusing upon some of the Calvinistic presuppositions coming into Romans 9. What are they? Who are they assuming the interlocutor is in Romans 9? What are they assuming that Paul is defending in Romans 9? They assume he's defending monergism. Uh, they assume that the interlocutor or the, the, the projected objector is objecting against determinism or Calvinism, double predestination. And, and I, I attack those presuppositions by demonstrating what the actual interlocutor is saying in the mind of Paul and who he's actually addressing. Instead of dealing with those arguments, White does his normal, uh, Leighton's not exegeting the text, so therefore I don't have to answer his arguments. And so he dodges the debate by not talking about our points of contention on the basis of my opponent didn't exegete the text. And I suspect, and I'm going to predict now, that's exactly what you'll see White do again, because that's his mode of operation. And the reason I'm convinced that he will do that, because he did it against Steve Gregg, and he did it against Michael Brown, and he did it, he did it in his response to John Lennox. Um, every single time that James White engages with this particular point of contention, he does the same mode of operation. His same mode of operation is, well, my opponent is exegeting the text, which means uh, to him, he's not talking about it in the same way that I'm talking about it. He's addressing a different topic than I think the passage is really about. Therefore, he must not be exegeting the text appropriately. Just a question begging argument. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that Jeff will have more objectivity when he listens to the debate in March. And, and I hope the audience of Jeff's audience will have more objectivity than just to buy that line of reasoning. Um, but I am glad he mentioned the, the debate because I want more people to see what we're going to bring out in that debate and the points of contention we're actually going to address in that debate. And I am uh, chomping at the bit to talk about some of those things because I've been studying a lot and I've learned a lot and there's a lot of things I want to bring to light, but I'm saving it for the debate. So Forgive me for not jumping into John 6, but I'm going to save that for the debate. I am too. So John 6, Jesus says, I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who has sent me. He says, and this is the will of him who has sent me, that if all that he has given to me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So what do you get there from Jesus? Is He says, this is my mission. This is what the Father has, has, has given to me to do and accomplish. And that is that he has given to me a people and I will lose not one of them, and I will raise them up on the last day. That is guaranteed salvation. He knows his own. He knows who he's come to save. He knows their name, John 10. He knows his sheep by name, and they hear his voice, and they follow him. He says to the unbelievers that were there, he says, the reason you don't believe is because you can't hear me is because you're not of my sheep. That's exactly right. So he says, the reason you don't hear me is because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Okay, so we're, we're, I'm not going to debate John 6 with Jeff because, uh, like I said, I'm saving that for the debate, but I will, I will t touch on John 10, okay? And it gets to the same point. Um, you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. Now, if you have the Calvinistic lenses on coming into that verse, what do you read? Well, you hear, well, you don't believe in me because I didn't choose you. Because what, what, are the, what do the Calvinists read when they see the word sheep? Well, they think, well, that's elect. That, that's talking about the unconditionally elected ones, my people that I picked before the foundation of the world. Those are my sheep. And the reason you don't believe is because I didn't pick you. I don't really want you. 
I don't love you. I, I'm not here to die for you. You're not my sheep. That's what they hear. Now, now they would never say it maybe that clearly. Matter of fact, when I've said it that clearly and White has responded to me, he just box at it and just, oh my gosh, and, and feigns clutching per pearls and all those kinds of things. But that's exactly what their interpretation entails. Is that basically what Jesus is saying to these people who he's held out his hands to all day long, longing to gather them, uh, that he is, um, uh, you know, weeps over in Luke 19, that he really doesn't want these people. And the reason they're not believing is because he never really wanted them to believe and he doesn't love them and he didn't, he's not dying for them. They're not his. That's what they, they, they interpret that verse to mean this. Okay. So you may think, well, okay, then Leighton, how do you interpret it? You're just criticizing Calvinists. You've got to come with a, an exegesis of your own. You've got to interpret it yourself. Well, I have dozens of times before. It's in my book. I've talked about it a thousand times on broadcast, but I still get Calvinists saying, oh, all you're doing is everything anti-Calvinist. You never give us your own exegesis. You never tell us what your view is. And that's because they're only listening to White. Because White rarely, rarely does he actually play or listen to actual, actual exegetical commentary that I bring. He'll bring a little clip off of Twitter and hyper-focus on that instead of focusing upon what we say this means. Well, okay, how do we understand this? Well, he says to them, I told you, but you do not believe. Now, back up and say, who is he telling this to? I told you, and you do not believe. Why aren't these people believing? He's talking to Israelites. That's the audience, his Israelite audience. They do not believe. Well, John or, or, uh, later in John 12, 39, he says, the reason they do not believe is because I've hardened their hearts and closed their eyes. And I have, uh, they are now ever seeing and never perceiving. So the audience he's talking to here are Israelites who have grown calloused and hardened due to their rebellion. Um, just like I read out of Acts 28 earlier, is they, they have become callous, they've closed their eyes, otherwise they might see, hear, understand, and turn, and they would be healed. So this, that's the audience that he's speaking to. And so these are people who are not listening and learning from the Father. They're not obeying the Father. They're not followers of God. And therefore, what Jesus is saying, you're not my follower, my sheep, because you never have followed the Father. If you followed the Father, then you would recognize me as his son because he and I are one. So the reason you're not following me is because you never followed God. If you followed God, you would recognize me because he and I have the same voice. You see, sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd, right? We all know that about sheep. Well, if you followed God for years and years and years, like Simeon, for example, he was a Jewish man who followed God. He knew God's voice. He knew the voice of God, like, like Cornelius, who was actually a Gentile. He knew the voice of God. So if Jesus comes and introduces himself to Simeon or to the other sheep like Cornelius, for example, God-fearing people, do you think they're going to recognize the voice of Jesus? Yes. Why would they recognize the voice of Jesus? Because the voice of Jesus sounds exactly like the voice of the Father who they already follow. That's the context of this verse, okay? The, the remnant of Israel, the believing remnant of Israel would recognize the Son because they're followers of the Father. And that's the context of this verse, just like the context of John 6, by the way. I don't think Jeff even knows that. I could be wrong, he doesn't comment enough about this verse for me to know whether he recognizes our interpretation of it. But based in the haphazard way in which he quotes this verse, as if we haven't considered it, or as if we don't have an interpretation of it, or as if it can only be understood from a Calvinistic perspective, demonstrates to me that he very likely doesn't have a working knowledge of how we would understand this passage, or John 6, for example. Again, notice that my interpretation doesn't create this seeming injustice or partiality or favoritism of God. It doesn't create this disdain of wondering, how could God be fair and that be true? It doesn't do any of those things. It actually flows with the text very, very easily and intuitively. It actually goes to highlight exactly what he argues down in a few verses later, I and the Father are one. So, if, Jesus, if, if, if I and the Father are one is the whole point Jesus is making in this discourse, then for him to say, the reason you don't follow me is because you're not a follower of God is perfect in the Gospel of John. Because over and over and over throughout the Gospel of John, he says, if you believed the Father, you would believe me. If you believe what Moses taught, then you would believe me. Why? Because he taught about me. 
that's that's Jesus's argument throughout the book of John over and over and over and over again that I and the Father are one. If you recognized his voice and you followed his teaching and his voice, you would recognize me because he and I are the same. Do you see how simple that verse is? There's no esoteric baggage of God picking people and rejecting everybody else and reprobation and superlapsarian and infralapsarian and all these nuances of all this. It's really simple. Sheep means follower. If you followed God, you would follow me, but you don't follow God, so therefore you don't follow me. It's really, really that simple. And guess what? They're to blame for it. It's their fault on my view. It's not just some condition by default they were born under by divine decree. It's not It's not that they were hated by God before they were ever born. It, it, it's not any of those things. It's their fault. They could have and should have listened and learned from the Father and followed his voice so that they would recognize their own Messiah when he stands right in front of them. It's their fault, not a divine decree's fault, not a lacking of God's provision or lacking of God's love. And when you understand that, Calvinism begins to just dissipate and people begin to flock places and like side ch- comments that I'm seeing even now and comments that I get in my inbox over and over and over again saying, thank you so much. I was a Calvinist for so many years and now I can finally see how these verses are taken from a different vantage. It never set right with me. A lot of these comments will say, I, I, I knew there was something wrong with how they interpret it, but I just really thought, you know, passages like John 10 and 6 and and uh, in Romans 9, I just thought, man, that, I can't see it any other way. And then all of a sudden, the, the, like the, the light comes on, and they see these passages in a non-Calvinistic light for the first time, and they go, oh, wow, that makes so much more sense. And I don't have all of this other baggage making God look like he's duplicitous and making God look like he wants something that he doesn't really want and having the two calls and the two kinds of love and the two kinds of wills of God and the two kinds of grace and the two kinds of everything to make my system work with every all these verses that seem to express God's desire and longing on one hand, but his decreative will on the other and all these kinds of strange, hard to explain passages, all of that just... And it's like this huge weight just lifted off your shoulder. You go, wow, the gospel's simple. Oh, it is so much easier to defend the glory and the goodness of God under provisionism than it is under Calvinism. And you will realize that once you start seeing the light come on and all of these passages as they begin to break away and the vision becomes clear and you begin to go, wow, the beauty and the goodness of God is so much greater underneath this understanding of who God is. And so that's what I want you to see. Moving on voice and I know them and they will follow me. Uh, But in John 6, Jesus says there's a people given to him by the father and he will raise them up in the last day. But he doesn't just say that. He says in John 6, 44, he says, no man, no one can come to me. Okay. So that's ability. No one has the ability to come to me. So how do we ever get the idea that God somehow is, however you want to express it, like looking through time or, or knowing all of time and knowing the actions of people that, okay, I'll choose them on the basis of their faith in me. They are willing to be humble. They are willing to come to me. They are willing to seek me. Notice he has to introduce some other esoteric view that sounds as strange, if not stranger than his esoteric view. You know what the word esoteric means? Uh, I know sometimes I use these words because I've kept, I've caught on to them and wrote them in some article or something, and I and I use them over and over again. And sometimes I just assume everybody esoteric means mysterious, strange way of understanding something, um, versus a very simple, plain reading. Okay, um, and so the the way the Calvinist oftentimes makes their esoteric view not seem so esoteric and to seem more plausible is to paint the other side, the other view as being even more esoteric, more strange, mysterious. And that's why you've got Matt Chandler saying something like, Arminians believe God gets into a DeLorean, travels through the future to foresee, and he has to look through the cords of time and learn what people are saying, all this kind of stuff, as if the Bible, as if the scripture is talking about either one of those esoteric, weird, strange things. It's not talking about either one of those things. Um, Just so chomping at the bit to get into some of this stuff out of John 6. But I'm going to refrain. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm listening to you, Dr. Pritchett. Uh, Dr. Pritchett told me, don't don't go burn a bunch of broadcast on covering everything. Wait for the debate. And I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And therefore, I'll choose them because I know in my perfect knowledge that they're willing to believe in me. That's not what Jesus said when he talks about the election of the Father. And he talks about these people given to him by the Father. He didn't say it like that. He doesn't believe that. Jesus doesn't believe that that the Father looks through time somehow or knows all of time and knows all potentialities or however you want to work this out. Jesus doesn't say that the Father goes, oh, and they were able to come and so he draws them. Jesus said the opposite. He says, no one is able to come to me. No one is able. That sounds like Jesus in John 8. It does, right? Jesus in John 8 says, whoever commits sin is a slave Uh of sin. Slaves aren't free. Unless the Son sets you free, 
you uh, you should be free indeed. So Jesus says no one's able to come to me. Right, and, and I will comment on that. Um, you, you can you can affirm that sinners are slaves to sin without affirming, therefore they're incapable of confessing their enslavement, their bondage in light of the gospel. Wh who is the gospel sent to? Enemies who are slaves to sin. So the gospel is sent to enemies in order to reconcile them. It's sent to those who are enslaved to sin in order to what? Set them free. If you suppress the truth, you will remain in bondage. If you accept the truth, it will set you free. It's that simple. So saying that you're enslaved to something doesn't prove Calvinism. It just proves that you're enslaved to something. And even slaves can confess their enslavement. Even slaves recognize their bondage and their chains. And there's nothing about being a slave that suggests that you can't confess your enslavement in light of the life-giving truth calling us to freedom. Come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, every synergist can't get away from what Jesus says there. And so what they'll do is they'll say, well, yeah, you know, the Father has to draw. I mean, I get it. Yeah, there's, we're all sinners. The Father has to draw. L follow Jesus to the end of the sentence. He says, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up. Jesus raises up the one the Father draws. Now, unless you like you to... I like that, by the way. I'm fine with all of that you just said. I'm fine with him. It, Jesus draws them and they're raised up in the final day. Nothing to do with unconditional election, but um, I'm saving saving that for later. Versalism, you're going to have to deal with the fact that Jesus says there are a people given to him by the Father. He is not going to fail in saving them. He will raise them up, and none of them were able to come to him right. unless the Father drew them. Mm -hmm. So again, if you think the, draw, the Father is drawing everybody by his grace for salvation, if you think that the Father's drawing everybody for, by his grace for salvation, then that means that everybody will be saved because Jesus says that the, he raises up the one the Father draws. You see the problem? Mm. Is that there's no way out of this, and we could just go on for days. So the fact that he says there's no way out of this proves that he didn't listen to Michael Brown's debate. He didn't listen to Steve Gregg's debate with his mentor. Um, he did not listen to our discussions over the, the time because we do have a differing interpretation that doesn't require universalism, nor does it require us changing anything that he just said is true about John 6. But again, I digress. For days with these verses, but I see you wanted to say something. No, it's it's a hard pill, I think, to swallow initially because it's like, well, God wants everyone. You know, he desires everybody. But again, you have to deal with that text mm -hmm. that you just lay out there. Yeah. There is a people given to the Son by the Father. There's no way out. And those same people, Ephesians chapter 1. But you're assuming that the people are unconditionally chosen. You, you can't assume that. You have to establish it in that text. Tells us are chosen in him. That's in Christ mm -hmm. before the foundation of the world. And they're predestined for adoption to himself. That's God the Father as sons. Through when are we adopted? I agree we're predestined. Believers are predestined to be adopted. But when are believers adopted? Read a Romans 8, 23. We eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So I know that I'm going to be adopted as a child of God, a believer in Christ, because God has destined beforehand. The destination is set beforehand for those who are in Christ. And what is that? That I will be glorified, adopted. I take up ownership with the one who adopted me. I go to, to the place he's prepared for me. He's going to prepare a home for me. So I take up my place. The redemption of my body is something that God has destined beforehand for those who are in Christ. It doesn't mean that God has destined beforehand those who will put their faith in Christ. It's not what the verse says. The verse says that those in Christ have been destined, predestined, destined beforehand to be made holy and blameless. What is that? Sanctification. What is it to be adopted? Glorification. It'd be a, a redemption of our bodies. That's a part of what God has destined beforehand. So these spiritual blessings in Ephesians 1 are destined beforehand for those who do what? Put their faith in Christ. Through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. So God's grace is the manifold centerpiece in the middle of all of this. The creature is out here as a recipient of this loving kindness. And then at the center, you have God's free gift. Mm -hmm. which is the highlight. It's the thing in the middle that is, is, is inducing the praise. And then connecting to that, jumping ahead a few verses in verse 11, in him, Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So there's the will of God according to the divine counsel. And you and I, if you're in Christ, have been predestined unto this glory according to the counsel of God's will. So it's funny when you're listening to this, you can just go, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. Same vocabulary, different dictionary. There's so many of the things that they're saying. I'm just going, yeah, I agree with all of that. But I just don't 
of the presumptions they have with regard to what that entails. And so that's what I was talking about, the duck and the rabbit, you know, that we've always mentioned with the book, uh, the duck and the rabbit. Um, when you're looking at it from the view of the duck versus the view of the rabbit, you hear the exact same v- verbiage and it sounds like, yeah, that's a, it's supporting exactly what I believe is true, but they're having a, a different definition in the way they're looking at the same verse. And so there's nothing he's saying here that I actually contend with. And this is one of the issues that I had with White's opener in the debate over Romans 9 is that so much of what he was saying with things that I'm just going, yeah, we agree with that, but we, but that's not our point of contention. Th- those are just benign statements that we all would affirm. I want to get to our points of contention. What, what are you meaning behind that statement? What is the, what is the meaning of that? What are the assumptions you're bringing into the verse about that? Because if you're not getting there, you're not getting to the point of contention and you're not helping anyone in the debate. So all those things together, God's grace, his glory, his counsel, his will. He's at the center. Uh-huh. And we're merely at the bottom of the waterfall with this stream pouring down on our heads. That's where we are. Right. We're the recipients, right? We're not the center uh, character of the story here. It's God, and we're just merely uh, receiving this. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Again, the question becomes, the, the well, on, on what say. basis do you receive and someone else rejects? Mm-hmm. What's the determinant cause of that, right? Well, it would have to be. In other words, what determines, in other words, the, the question assumes determinism. It assumes that that someone besides the agent is determining it. So what is determining it? And so this is the question begging fallacy. It's what I get into in, uh, in uh, the, the article um, is what, you know, uh, on uh, Sociology 101, if you wanna go there and look at it, you can, where I, I walk through that, that question, the number one question, are you, you think you're better than somebody else is the reason you believe and they don't. And I walk through the five different fallacious ways in which Calvinists use that argument um, and again, it's there at Sociology 101. If you typed in the word friend, even it would, because it, it, the title of it is, why did you accept it, the gospel, and your friend did not? So if you went to Sociology 101, typed in the word friend, that would be the first article. Um, it is over two hours. And um, my voice, I don't know if you can tell this, it feels scratchy to me, but it's really starting uh, to, to wear on me. I, I preach earlier today, and then I'm speaking here for two hours straight. And so I'm gonna I'm going to bring this to a close they actually get into Romans nine next. And that's my bread and butter. That's where I love to go because that's what I wrote this book over. And um, most of this book is a line by line uh, commentary over Romans nine um, uh, and the, the potter's promise. Uh, and so I, I'd love to go through it, but I am going to bring this to an end and I'm going to put this on a back burner because I may pick up right here at around the hour mark of Jeff Durbin's broadcast from Apologist Radio and, and, and spend the next section that we have going through their commentary of Romans nine, because I do think it always does a really good job. Yeah. Go change your, yeah, Jamie is saying, go change your banjo string. Layton. <laughs> I could keep, keep strumming along. Uh, I, I hear you. I'd love to keep going. I really want to, because I really, um, I really want to get into what they talk about in Romans nine. I'm chomping at the bit, if you will, to, to get into that subject. Um, but I, I think I need to, to, to save it for another broadcast. Um, and, uh, before we go, as I always do, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for liking and sharing this video. Every time you click the like button, when you comment on the video, it changes the algorithm in YouTube and it puts it up and it recommends it. Um, when you give a super chat, it helps to recommend it to other people because if they're commenting, and they're liking it and uh, even disliking it. I mean, it, that occur, that goes towards the algorithm. All of those things help us spread the news of God's love and provision. So please like, share, subscribe. And if you want to become a patron or if you want to make a one-time gift, the link is in the show notes. Help us spread the news of God's love and provision to all people. Go now, share Christ and show love. God bless. And by the way, go Cowboys. Go Cowboys. <laughs>